59? Or? Yeah, it was like 59, yeah. 60. Gentlemen, we're yeah. live. Well, we're officially live. Episode number what? What is today? Because the number doesn't 116. say 116. Okay, 116 with Seth Dillon, the CEO of Babylon B. Fake news you can trust. Good to have you back, buddy. <laughs> no. Thanks for having me. Yes. Uh, last time we had John was more of an interview uh, format. Today will be more podcasts. Uh, Gerard is a big fan of your website. I know Adam as well. And so we're excited to have you back. You had Elon Musk on recently. We yes, did. you got. How was that for you guys? Insane. Uh, I, I was up until the last minute, right before it happened. I had no idea if it was actually going to happen. You know, we were kind of going back and forth with him, DMing, talking about having him on the podcast. And he's like, "Come to Austin, and we'll do it." So we you're showed DMing up. with Elon. Is what we were you're DMing saying? with him. Yeah, okay. on Twitter. He follow, he's follows like 107 people on Twitter. We're one of them. Um, and so we're able to access his DMs and just. And one of our one of our employees just shot him a message out of the dark. You know, it was just like, "Hey, What's you up, wanna, bro, you want to come on our podcast?" And, <laughs> and uh, we were not prepared. I was on vacation with my family, and he responded and was like, "Yeah, come to Austin." So I left from where we were instead of going home and went straight out there with the clothes on my back uh, and rented a studio to try to make it happen. And so we didn't even know if it was going to happen until the minute he walked in. I but like the way you said that. Awesome. I said he follows like 107 people. Like you didn't know the exact the number exact of people. Number. Yeah, currently was, 107. Yeah, so he follows like 100 people. He Rough, follows like 107. He used what? to be 108. It <laughs> makes sense for him to be a fan of Babylon B. Yeah. It makes sense. His personality just makes sense to say, you know what? I like what these guys are doing. Mm-hmm. So what was your favorite part of the conversation with him? Oh, we went everywhere. I mean, we were talking religion and theology. We were talking uh, uh, the current, like, cultural climate, wokeness, uh, he called it a mind virus, um, you know, we were getting into that a little bit. Yeah, sad. Yeah, so he was, uh, he was all over the place, but we were just letting him talk, you know, we ta- he talked a lot about some of the stuff that he's um, uh, digging into right now with his Neuralink and, and the satellites he's launching into space for Starlink and all this stuff, so, I mean, we, it was a wide-ranging discussion, but um, it, was, it was fun to just kind of have like a... Uh, less serious interview with him, you know, where we could make jokes and see how he responded to those. And he doesn't always laugh at your jokes, which can be a little unsettling and unnerving when yeah. you're there cracking jokes and he's just kind of nodding along like you just said something serious. That's a little... <laughs> it makes it it makes Maybe it your jokes got to be funnier, so. Yeah, they got, I guess they got to be funnier. He does like our jokes. Um, but yeah, it was a good time. It was a good can, time. Can you go on Babylon B's website right now? Let's just go right on Babylon B's website because, you know, folks, again, if you... Haven't followed these guys. They're hilarious for the work they do. Uh, put, go, go down to the story with Kamala Harris and uh, Hillary Clinton. Like, this is the kind of stuff you guys write, which is uh, go a little lower, a little lower, right there. Click on that one right there. So Kamala Harris so disliked nation considering Hillary Clinton. That's just <laughs> hilarious to me, right? Let's, let's see what else you guys got that's recent. Uh, 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 Seth, which one would you say to pull up? Let's see this one. Historian discovers document from 1776 that removes all mandates and restrictions. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to the trending tab, that'll show the ones that are being shared the most recently. Okay, uh, the second one right there, right below the logo. If you go up, go go above, go all the way to the top. Yeah, and click on trending. Yeah, right there. And there you go. Tyler. Let's see what we got. FBI said they still haven't found a, a motive for 9-11. <laughs> to save Tom Biden to ship 500 million free masks directly to <laughs> landfill. landfill. Fantastic. Historians discovered, okay, we read that, Omicron vaccine to be made available in March for the 12 people who haven't gotten <laughs> Omicron yet. Politicians, uh, baff, politician baffle, uh, baffles nation by doing exactly what he said he was going to do. Is the filibuster racist a handy flow chart? Anyways, just, yeah. and, and by the way, this is, uh, uh, if you go to, put Babylon B's best stories ever. I know we did this on the, uh, the other channel, but we haven't done it here. Just go on Google and type in Babylon B's best stories ever. Okay, best uh, stories ever. Yeah, click on that. There's a, what's the one site that's got the best ones on there? No, not here. There, go back. Uh, 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 Seth, do you know which one it is? There's a site that's got your best ever that oh. went viral. You know the headlines Babylon B would have? Okay, go a little lower. I'm, you go I'm not sure. Two. Okay, right there. Ten best. No, it's not that one. Anyways, you guys had uh, the one uh, with uh, Trump that said that Trump says he's done more for Christianity than Jesus himself. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's uh, right there. I have there done more for Christianity than Jesus himself. And then the story comes out, that kind of similar thing to what he said. So th- the whole thing about satire, you said to me last time, is writing stories that seem so crazy that eventually could come true. 
Yeah. Which is happening to some of your stories you guys are writing. It happened to that one. Yeah, Trump exactly. Actually, Trump went on some uh, radio show where he said that he's, uh, he's done more for religion in general uh, and, and Christianity in particular than any figure in history. Uh, which is basically what we said that he said in that, in that. But we said it a couple of years ago, and he just said it a couple of months ago. With how so. insane the world is right now, are you guys having a tougher time than usual coming up with topics? Because I feel it's like it's like, easier. how do you get you know, more sarcastic and more insane than what's happening right now? How does it work? I, I say tougher. I mean, well, we sit there and try to brainstorm every day. We look at the headlines and what's going on in the news, right? And we start pitching ideas back and forth. Um, we start with the headline. Just the, the joke is in the headline, right? Mm -hmm. And... We, we pitch these headlines and we have to check, like, did this already happen? Did someone <laughs> already say this? Like, and, and you have to think to yourself, you know, like, how long is this going to be satire for? Because mm -hmm. uh, this is probably coming down the road here as soon as next week or maybe even tomorrow. Uh, and we find that happening all the time. So it's funny. We, we, uh, we, we tweet about it all. That we, we have our, uh, our editor-in-chief, Kyle Mann, and, and uh, our managing editor, Joel Berry. They'll tweet that, you know, another Babylon Beef prophecy fulfilled and we document those and 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 is, share with people is, when we see them come true is that how not the bee came about is that the idea there or it, it it is i mean well what we were discovering is you know the the world is so crazy the world's so absurd it's almost impossible to be satirized so we might as well have like this humor-based entertainment site that just covers all these crazy stories mm -hmm. because they're very entertaining the real stories really are wild and entertaining you can just click on any major news site and find a story that's like wow is this headline real so um, we did create the site specifically to cover those things, the things that are so crazy that should be satire but somehow aren't. So there's a little bit of overlap between the sites. You know, They start out satire on the Babylon Bee and then they become reality on Not The Bee. Speaking of overlap, have you found that The Onion has been subject to the same uh, ridicule that you guys have on social media? or We're subject to ridicule? <laughs> well, you, you tell me. I mean, I went to pull up the Babylon Bee and it asked me if I was uh, going to a dangerous site. So, uh, Did it really? Yeah. yeah, we get a little bit of that. Um, uh, you know, they have been, um, they've been targeted with some criticism. They do get fact-checked some, the mm -hmm. way that we've been fact-checked. I think, look, it's, it's, you, you see the same kind of bias at play here with comedy that you see in every area of life. It's, you know, the, the, the mainstream media is really friendly to uh, sources that agree with them. And I think, you know, The Onion is, it, 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 this is one of the topics we discussed in our interview with Elon Musk. He was talking about The Onion and how it's, it's further left than we are right. It's very politically correct. Very politically correct. You know, they hit all they hit all the jokes from the angle that you would expect them to hit them from. More so today so, than it wasn't that way when it first started. They they were much, a lot yeah. of speaking truth to power. I mean, the whole concept of comedy for people that don't know. I mean, if you're find yourself agreeing with the establishment as a comedian, you're a bad comedian. You know, the the idea of speaking truth to power. People don't know who Lenny Bruce is. Lenny Bruce spent half of his career in jail. Mm -hmm. For refusing to, to for just like, cursing at that point, yeah, like, for lewd and vicious yeah. behavior, talking in the about 50s, sex, though, yeah, so that was very and counterculture then, at that point. But dude, when I before I left New York, man, I like you know I saw the tides turning, and I was like, man, this is not about being funny. This is about being on message. And then right. you saw people that were getting you know fast tracked. I'm not going to name names. You can really easily Google them and remember who they are. Their careers were getting fat. They were doing mics at the Village Lantern, and the next thing you know, they had Netflix specials because they were on message. And it was like, this is they're skipping ten years here. Well, now so, you got people like Chappelle who are doing Netflix specials and taking a lot of heat for it because they step outside the bounds of where they're, what they're supposed to be joking about, right? And I think that's what comedians should be doing. I think they should be making those jokes that nobody wants you to make. Yeah. Um, well, and, Chappelle and if you're is censoring in a league of yourself, his own. No, no, but he's not. But the highest form of the art, he's right, though. The highest form of the art is saying things people don't want to hear in a way they can't stop listening. Well, that, that's you the, might have texted what, what Steve Harvey had to say. Was that you? Was yeah. that you? Yeah, yeah. He basically saying Chappelle's the only person that can do this. Any person out there other than my speaking of himself, he was talking about DL Hughley I'll, or, he's like, I'll or do Cedric one, Entertainer I will do one or Kevin more, Hart. Exactly. I will do one more special and that's when I'm done because with my career. Because they're all who's reliant that? on who's sponsors. Steve Harvey. What, Harvey. What's his point with that? Steve because I'm going to I'm going to let it fly and then I'm going to go away. Yeah, I don't, he can't do it right you, now you can't because he's still, he's he's still gonna, trying yeah. to do stuff. So he's saying later on. Yeah, okay. but, but his whole point Got was the, yeah. despite <clears throat> all the success I've yeah. had, despite mm -hmm. all the money, despite all the power, despite all the fame, I'm beholden to sponsors. Exactly. And, and where that, Chappelle and, has yeah. subscription with Netflix. Exactly. And so Netflix is probably going to go after more comedians. I, look at, look at, that at that Tim Dillon. Tim Dillon's the guy. Tim Dillon is a guy that... No would, relation to Seth or no, what? No relation to Seth. Tim Dillon. You know, Rogan yeah. on, on in a certain way. I mean, yeah. these Marcello guys, opens for him. You, right. you make your you make yourself uncancelable by insulating you. But at the end of the day, it's the marketplace. 
Mm-hmm. Nine, you know, if, if 90,000 people are willing to pay four ninety nine a month for Tim Dillon, then all the sponsors can shove. He can say whatever he wants to say. Those people are supporting him. It's one of the ways that we're independent is because we have a subscription platform. People can subscribe to support us. And so we don't have to worry so much about um, – and this is the reason we launched it in the first place is because we were worried. We were getting fact-checked on Facebook like crazy. They're rating our jokes false. They're giving our jokes a truth rating. Yeah. And then telling <laughs> us jokes, yeah. jokes. The whole and then point telling of us, jokes is they're supposed to be a little. Uh, have you ever gone? They down don't have a truth rating. They're exactly. funny or they're not. They're not true right. or false. Have right? you ever gone down the rabbit hole with who's fact checking you? Because I because I, I got demonetized on Facebook and I went down yeah. the rabbit hole and was looking at who fact checked me, and you end up looking at it's it's like some bot out in in in, in Singapore. That has no existence. It's it's like this person, and it's just an opinion. They, this person says that you know what you're saying is false. I was like, it's satire. Well, we it's found some literally. of them. So I'll give you an example of one. We did a story on how Ruth Bader Ginsburg had over, no, the Ninth Circuit Court had overturned the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That was the headline, <laughs> right? And it's kind of a silly, absurd headline. Obviously, you can't. How do you overturn somebody's right, death? Exactly. What does that even mean? It's obvious like, it's a joke. Did they resurrect her from the dead? Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's a joke. USA Today fact checked it, rated it false. And if you scroll to the bottom of that fact check, it says it was paid for in part by grants from Facebook. So Facebook paid USA Today to fact check our joke and then send us a warning saying that we made a joke that was false. So it's kind of a circular thing where they're funding the whole system. Let me system. ask you, Pat talks about, in the business planning workshop, that's where it really came to mind. He talks about finding an enemy, finding an enemy, and that sort of motivates you to you know, double down on what you, what you want to accomplish. And you know, Pat has some enemies that I'm sure he'll talk about uh, vocally. Do you have enemies that you say, all right, I don't know if it's the onion or if it's the establishment, if it's cancel culture, who's the Babylon B enemy? Who do you go against? Uh, the enemy is anybody who's against free speech. The enemy is anybody who's trying to censor you. The enemy is anybody who's trying to pressure you to censor yourself so that you're not free to say what you think and why you think it. Um, so, you know, anybody, any comedian that censors himself in deference to the power that's trying to get him to censor himself is a joke himself, mm. I think. And so comedians should be pushing back on that and making jokes, humorous, so satirists. Who, so who is doing yeah. it right today? Who's, who's uh, I mean, obviously you got the Chappelle's, you got the Rogan's. Who else would you put in the camp that is pushing the envelope and not holding hold them back? And who have you seen has made major adjustments and gone and become woke or soft? Any names in oh, the market? Man. You know, the, the amount, that's, oh man. The amount of schadenfreude I had watching all of New York City, who for 10 years I, I saw gradually descend into this nonstop, you know, uh, carrying water for, for the state. You know, they just became the, the, this woke, hardcore, leftist, activist sect. And then they got shut down. And they were like, the government, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, oh, is, oh, oh, is the government overreaching, guys? Can't go to work? Oh, that sucks. Who, so give me names, though. Like, who do you think? Uh, like, like, who's, who's, give, give the names of who is pushing back today. I, I'll tell you, um, some, look, the guy, J.P. Sears. J.P. Sears has done an unbelievable job. You know, you interviewed Absolutely. J.P. Sears. Uh, Ryan the, Long is, is Ryan, doing a lot of jokes that are like, Hilarious dude, Ryan Long. Um, Bill Maher comments a lot on nope. cancel culture, and he's very anti cancel culture. Jimmy he's more Dorn. of an old school liberal who believes in yeah, freedom. That's right. Believes you, you know, he he agrees with the left on almost every issue. The only the thing that he doesn't agree with the left on is uh, this kind of authoritarian attempt to silence anybody who disagrees with them. Right. So. Uh, and that applies to a lot of comedians, and he's felt a lot of pressure. He he faces calls to be canceled all the time for the stuff that he says. And mostly what yeah. he's saying is, stop cancel culture. Mm-hmm. And they want to cancel him for saying that. Yeah, he'll say, I can't stand just, Trump. I can't stand what these guys are doing. But stop trying to cancel these guys, what they have to say. Because yeah. even back in the days, if you think about those who were f- against censorship were – Representing the left, now it's them who want 100%. to censor. It's, it's the most... 100%. This, but by the way, this is one of the weirdest dynamics about uh, today's climate is how much hypocrisy there is on both sides. You, mm-hmm. you have hypocrisy today. You have freedom of speech. You have, you know, my body, my choice, only sure. when it matters. You have all of these areas that it goes to ID. I need to ID. I need to give you a vaccine passport. But mm-hmm. now when it comes down to voting, you go down, you say, wait a minute... Uh, this is this is your core belief system, but you're completely opposite from this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when you go there, you know what typically happens when uh, your philosophies start having having uh, contradictions in them. 
your own side starts saying, you know what, I just, I'm not feeling you no more. Mm -hmm. I'm just not feeling you no more. You know, this is when you, it, it, people think just because you have a following, they're always going to be there. Like, you know, just because you're famous, you're always going to be famous. Just mm -hmm. because, you know, Roger Stone said something one time. He said, here's how fame works. Everybody starts off, uh, the first thing everybody says is, who is Roger Stone? Who, who, who the hell is Roger Stone? Roger Stone's the guy that can get you elected. Oh, oh, okay. Get me Roger Stone. Okay, phase number two. Get me Roger Stone. He says, phase number three is get somebody like Roger Stone. He says, phase number four is who is Roger Stone? <laughs> Meaning you're eventually forgotten about, you right? Come full circle. Yeah. So, so the point is, the political parties is they're like celebrities. They're they were famous uh, for uh, a year and a half ago. Liberals were famous a year and a half ago. Meaning, you're loved. You're like, oh my gosh, they're right. Trump sucks. And now they're thinking that was going to continue, and it's not. Because fame and, you know, that whole loyalty, if you try to bully the voter, voters that you have, you can't bully your voters, you can't bully your customers, you can't bully the people that were loyal to you at one point. You have to constantly keep those people. Yeah. And it's a very hard thing to do. By the way, something both sides struggle with continuously. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time, man. And I think that, you know, one of the things that concerns me more than anything else, Pat, is that I agree with you. The hypocrisy is rampant, but there seems to be like people who seem to be like okay with it all of a sudden. Who's people though? I disagree. You disagree? Yeah, I disagree. I don't think it's people. I I don't think it's okay. Uh, uh, I've seen, and let me just explain because I've seen the goalposts move with my own friends. Sure. What they will do to maintain some semblance of uh, of allegiance. Yeah. To their their demagogue, you yeah. know what I'm saying? It's like, well, you know, I mean, look, look, look at the the thing that that we're not allowed to talk about, right? Like, first it was going to stop you from getting sick, then it's like, well, it just stops the severity of sickness, and then it's like, ah, well, it's going to stop somebody else from getting sick, and now like the next thing is going to be like, well, it gives you two points towards heaven if you die. It's like, I mean, like, what's this? so? There's always going to like it, at at no point, yeah. Do any of them go like, wait a minute, this is you know what? You had a point, man. This is I, I should have been asking some more questions. You know, here. you know. The other day, one one of our guys that works for us, one of our executives, his daughter, uh, uh, oldest daughter, goes to school, and she comes after school, finishing college, four years, and she can't stand the dad's dad's philosophies. He says, "We had dinner, and I'm like, why is my daughter, whom I raised, so against me?" Why does she hate me so much? Because you sent her to what, what, school. Hate these uh, the <laughs> philosophies I have so much, and and he sat there and he's like, man, I, I don't know. How. And as a parent, this is a fear because you don't want to lose your kids. You love these guys. This is an emotional thing. Parents today fear: Am I one day gonna lose my kids? My kids go to a cl uh, school. You guys know where they go to, mm -hmm. and the best school in Florida is right across the street. Everybody knows what the best school in Florida is. But that best school in Florida is not one that's teaching conservative philosophy. So in my mind, I'm like, at what age do I consider allowing the kids, because it's under my control till 18, mm -hmm. at what age do you want to be comfortable to send them there that anything can be taught? It's not, they're not praying. They ain't sitting there talking about God. They ain't sitting there talking about certain values and principles. Go at it, right? Yeah. They can teach anything they want to teach your kids. Well, communism is an option. Socialism is an option. You can marry whoever you want to be. If that person's a he, she, whatever. All this stuff is confusing to a young kid yeah. that's going through it, right? But here's, here's what I'm convinced. Here's what I'm convinced. Years ago, I'm sitting with um, a guy that's uh, 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 raised great kids, Dudley. Big fan, uh, big, big uh, mentor in my life. Uh, ran the biggest church in LA, and we're sitting down. Uh, and I said, "Listen, give me tips on parenting." And uh, you know, he was going through something with his son at the time. He said, "There's three phases parents go through. First, your kids idolize you. Mm -hmm. Then they demonize you. Then they humanize you. It's a phase. Mm -hmm. And a phase when parents go through demonizing, it sucks. It absolutely sucks because you're like, am I ever gonna get these guys?" Because you did something wrong as a parent. Just a matter of time before you screw up. It doesn't matter. You're going to screw up as a parent, right? Mm -hmm. He says, then eventually it's humanizing. Okay. So take that philosophy and bring it to capitalism, okay? You're a kid. Who do you admire? The lifestyle of the rich and famous. You're like, oh, man, one day, dude, I'd love to have that life. How cool would it be if one day, mom, I'm going to buy you a house, mom. I'm telling you, I'm going to buy you a house. Dad, I'm going to buy you that Ferrari you want. How many kids have spoken like that, right? Mm -hmm. And then you go to school 
And the teacher says, rich people are bad. All they do is they treat their employees like slaves, and this is what they do for their own. And they sit home, and they got these big bellies, and they make their money, and their, their employees are doing the work, and they're golfing. And the kids are like, these are horrible people. Oh, my gosh, I hate rich people, Mom. They're terrible. And then they come out of college, hating capitalists and rich people. And then they go to school, and then they go get a job, and all of a sudden, somebody gets a promotion over them who, for whatever reason, was a better ass kisser, was closer, was a better friend or whatever, but you're doing harder work, and that person gets the promotion over you, and then you're 28 years old, and now you're making $78,000, and you have to pay $13,000 in taxes, and you're sitting there saying, this shit doesn't make sense. <laughs> what the hell is this all about? And eventually you say... Maybe these capitalists are not that bad. So what, what I'm trying to tell you is I think we're about to go through the humanizing phase of people that are creating jobs. Mm -hmm. I think you're about to go through the humanizing phase to sit there and realize these principles kind of make sense. And eventually that 12% that runs America sure. is going to figure it out and say, you know what? I'm kind of going to go to freedom, not going towards control. I think that's what's going to be taking place. Mm -hmm. Well, I got a theory on it. I mean, you know, I've thought about this a lot, right? So think about... There's two aspects of it. Who who becomes a teacher? Who becomes a writer? Who becomes a professor? Pretty pretty intelligent people, but they don't make a lot of money, so they become very resentful into the system. Because here I am. I went to school. I went to school after school, and then I went to school after school, and I've got all these degrees and I have all this education, but I'm making sixty grand a year. Meanwhile, the plumber, you know, who while I was studying was was partying on Friday nights, is making two hundred grand a year, and he didn't go to college. You know what I mean? This guy, the truck driver, is making 150 grand a year. So they're resentful of the system in that because they think they should get paid for who they are, not for what they offer. And that's a big thing that 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 people mess up. You don't get paid for what you like to do unless you're literally the best in the world at it. Adam, you're very good at basketball, but you're not getting paid for it because you're not one of the, literally the best 300 in the world at it, right? So you have to be able to offer services. You can pave the driveway of one of those guys that makes you know that kind of money playing basketball and do a real good life for yourself because that guy doesn't want to pave his own driveway. You have to be able to offer value. If you're not the best in the world at something, you have to be able to offer value to the best in the world. That's number one. Number two, we go to school and we learn all about the victories of government. Think about it. We learn about how government saved the world in this war. We learned about how government saved. Well, history is written by the winners. Exactly, exactly so. right? So government's great with the Civil Rights Act. Government is great. Let's not let's not talk about how government implemented slavery. Let's talk about how government stopped slavery. Like, you get all the wins of government. So here we are. They're preaching this the, the egalitarian system where, you know, your merit based on your education is, is what you should get paid on, not, not the work that you do or your willingness to do work. It's not just how educated you are, how smart you are. And look at how great government is. So these kids come out saying, government's great. Why wouldn't you want to pay taxes? This yeah. is how we do things. And then you grow up into the real world. And this is the whole thing with my libertarian philosophy. This is almost every libertarian that I know. It's like, dude. Just show your work. You want more taxes. We, nobody, nobody wants to drive on decrepit roads and bad bridges. Show what you do with the money. Mm -hmm. Because right now, you took $3 trillion and gave us $1,200. And nothing changed. Everything got worse. There's empty shelves. There's a, a, I just went to buy furniture at City, at City Furniture. Nothing is there until the end of March. This is the United States of America. Yeah. I got nothing to the end of March. You've got uh, you know empty shelves. Somehow there's Valentine's Day candy, but there's nothing else. I have no idea how that works. So we gave you guys three trillion, and where's that money? And you want more of it? See, that's the thing that the the, the left never answers for. You always want more. If three trillion couldn't fix it, then six trillion. Your boy Robert Reich, more, more, more. Can you just show your work with what you're doing now? Can you just at least once? Prove that the money we gave you was worth something. Yeah. Before you ask for more, I mean, it's insane. I think I think you can only do that for so long. I I, I don't think you can. That's that philosophy is sustainable. Anyway, let's go into our main story here. Let's go into our main stories. I want to hear what Seth has to say about this as well. First story we want to get into is a great resignation. Okay, the great resignation. There's a story that everybody is talking about. A guy tagged me in a pic in a post. I just sent it to you. Uh, have it ready to bring it up in a minute here. I text it to you. So. This is a CNBC story. This is the biggest reason people quit, and it's 10 times more important than pay. 
from the data, Glassdoor review from the last few years, including before the pandemic and 172 culture metrics at roughly 600 companies, researchers found toxic work culture to be the biggest factor that led people to quit and 10 times more important than pay in predicting turnover. Okay, so toxic mm -hmm. culture is number one, is what they're saying. This is CNBC story. The most common ways employees describe toxic culture at their company were through a failure to promote diversity, equity, inclusion, workers feeling disrespected, unethical behavior or low integrity, abusive managers, and a cutthroat environment where they felt colleagues were actively undermining. So they're describing CNN, okay? So what's significant <laughs> is that toxic workplace factors lead to a stronger reaction, quitting more so than other bad work issues. People may grumble about their workplace being bureaucratic or feeling, slow, uh, uh, feeling siloed. siloed, but they still don't leave, but signs of toxic work culture are making people walk away. So. Uh, Tyler, just out of curiosity, is that the only story you have on the great resignation, or is there anything else on great resignation that you have? Uh, on there, that's it, but we can, we can pull, pull a few it's, things up. It's been the top story on LinkedIn it, It's for like weeks. there's a million stories. Yeah. So this one guy sends me this, and he says, you never talk about this on the podcast. I said, okay, let's talk about it. So corporations right now laid off staff in 2020, okay, uh, received generous government bailouts, totally agree. A lot of people took the bailouts, shouldn't have taken. They did not need it. A lot of companies didn't need that bailout. Uh, we had a board meeting, and our board meeting, I brought this up before, where they said, you know, we can get roughly $4.5 million. I said, we're not taking the money because we don't need it. Restaurants need it. I'm not taking that $4.5 Good for you. Man. But guess what? You don't have to pay it back. I said, I'm not taking a penny. My board was upset with me saying every single one of the boards we sit on, they take the money. You ain't taking the money. I said, I'm not taking the money. Why would I take the money? How hypocritical are my philosophies to take that money and put it into the bank account? But you know what? You're going to pay for it through taxes. That makes you think you better take it because you're going to pay through taxes. That's my philosophy. I totally get it. You're going to pay through tax. I'm like, you know what? I'm good. The restaurant needs it. Those 50 million employees in America that are directly or indirectly affected by those restaurants that have to shut down, let's kind of help those guys that I'm going to be okay. Using myths of resignation and labor shortage to understaff. Okay. I, I have no idea what you mean by that, but okay. Uh, this is a liberal Facebook fan page, just so you know. So I'm showing what they put. Shovel work on people that don't have a better option, okay? That's absolutely ludicrous. Let me explain to you why. People have more options today than ever before. I'm gonna show you something from an economist I heard last week mm -hmm. in Vegas that is gonna blow you away and it's not gonna be a good look for a certain president and it's not who you think it is when I go through it. Shovel work on people. You know what the challenge is today? The challenge today is here's how it works, okay? You hire somebody, you give them $45,000. They've never made $45,000. You hire somebody, you give them $55,000, but they have a now new title. So they go on LinkedIn and they change the title to such and such title. The recruiting firm calls them saying, hey, you're XYZ at this company. Yes, we'll offer you $70,000 with this other company mm -hmm. and they'll give you a $5,000 bonus. The guy has one month of experience in that job. So guess what he says? He comes back to the boss that gave him the job and he says, hey, uh, I, I love this place, but let me just tell you what offer I just got. If you give me the $70,000 and the $5,000 bonus, we can, we can keep you here. That boss is staying there and saying, what, the, what do you want me to do? I need this guy, but you're not worth this dollar amount. Mm -hmm. So then he sits there and he says, dude, I, I can't afford to pay you, man, that kind of money. But maybe we can bump you to 60? Let me see what I can do. I'm sorry, I gotta take this job. He takes that job at 70,000 with the $5,000 signing bonus. A month later, the same recruiter calls him. Calls another company. Says this other company wants to pay you $82,000 with a $7,000 bonus. This guy is underqualified. He says, hey man, you know, I'm, you know, I'm so sorry, bro, but you know, I love this place, but you know, so dude, we can't pay you, dude, you ain't worth $82,000, $7,000 a month. I got to go take the shot. He takes that job. Do you know I know a guy that went through the cycle four times mm -hmm. by the same recruiter getting until he got to six figures because a company was willing to pay for it. So that fourth one right there is a, is a bunch of uh, uh, gibberish. Yeah, but you can't blame that guy for taking the money. This I, is free agent. But, but, like, no, no, in no, no, NBA, wait a minute. No, no. Hear me out. In NBA, I get how many guys get overpaid because they had a big breakout season or they did well in the playoffs, and next thing you know, they were a $2 million guy. Now they're getting yeah. a... You know, fifty million dollar five year a, contract. What are you gonna say? Well, there, I'm not really a fifty. I'm not, I'm not sitting. Just saying, for, you're gonna take the money. I'm not sitting here and telling you anything. First of all, that guy's not a loyalty guy. His loyalty is to money. Go get your money. Do what Most you got. Most people are. That's that's not true. But fine, no problem. I I say that company 
their comp structure needs a better adjustment. Meaning, mm -hmm. if you want to get people to stick around with you, maybe give them equity, maybe give them long-term incentives that they can participate in. Maybe you gotta make certain adjustments there. I don't disagree there. But all I'm telling you is people are, you, you say most people are driven by money. Okay, so let me ask you a question. I'm not saying most wait, people wait, are driven by money, but wait I'm saying minute. most people, no, but wait a can minute. I say this thing? Yes, I, you if said it already. If you're making 45, yeah. 55, and all of a sudden someone's giving you 100 and you're actually thinking they're gonna, Maybe, maybe not. They're taking the hundred grand. Do you grand. realize? Don't. But but do you realize what you're setting as your reputation on your resume? Let me explain to you. So so you're thinking about getting married one day, no? Yes. Okay. Are you the richest guy in the world? No. Well, that's no. Elon Musk. Well, no, 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 well, are you? The, so that means every girl should leave their husbands and go with Elon Musk. So now, let's just say you get married Elon to your wife. Does dominate, let's just yes. say you get married to to your girl. <laughs> Drop that gorgeous girl. You're gonna marry a hot girl. We know that. But let's just Thank marry you, your Pat, girl. I appreciate that. But you ain't the richest guy in Miami. That's you true. definitely ain't the richest Jew in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> so now she yes. meets another Jew. Okay. Who's worth a hundred million? And he says, wink, wink. You come with me. I'll get you an S five hundred, and I'll get you this house mm -hmm. if you leave me. So now, hey, you should take your money and go to the next guy. And then she gets another guy. Is that the, like, do we well, go like... Well, the difference is you can only marry one person no, at a time. That's you can not, go from job to job to job true, to job. But the point is, that is, you're a Mormon. that is not a good look on your resume to show you have four jobs. Like when people... I agree with you on that. Yeah, you can't just so, go from job to job to yeah, job to but job. That's, but that's but if me you is, keep getting more bonuses... That to, and, me, that to me is also a mindset that you can be bought, you're for sale. It is not a good values and principles on the individual. You create a market and say, I come and I make it work here. Then you force that company to pay you exactly what you're worth in the marketplace because they have to. There is no choice. When I give you a promotion to COO, I have to pay you what the market is for the COO. If I give you a promotion to a, any promotion, I have to pay you what the market tells me. You go on salary.com and salary.com says what? The position for a director of digital media in Fort Lauderdale is mm -hmm. the low, 78,000, high, 150, medium, 103, whatever it's going to tell me. Oh, shit. I got, dude, so what do we got? Am I going to get this or not? I have to work it because you're in favor if you deliver. That guy who changes position four times, the company is eventually going to realize this guy's clueless. And he's going to get fired four months later. So then he has to go back and explain to somebody else why he got fired. He's got to make an excuse. Well, you know, it was because of equity. And because uh, it's a toxic, toxic environment, <laughs> and, and it was just a terrible place, I Seth. Know. I got to tell you, I, Pat. I've been in places where that guy is terrible and doesn't get fired specifically because he got hired. You're, and that's worse for the company because that company doesn't have leadership and they're desperate. Let me do the last one, and I'll open it up. I want to hear you guys' mm -hmm. thoughts. Use the myth of inflation to raise prices, folks. That's not myth. The myth. What? That's called math. Do me a favor. Go to one of the slides that this chief economist JD go up five slides. Uh, 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 and by the way, go, keep going up, keep going up, keep going up. I think that's the one. No, not that one. Go one more. Yeah, that one right there. Okay, can you make that bigger so everybody can see that? And David, can you put that on the screen so everyone can see it? Are, are we going back to that last slide, by the way? Because the guy only got the one top thing right, or the second thing, and then the last three were just absolute yeah, garbage. Yeah, but 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 if the media keeps saying toxic, 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 here's what's going on. The company's inflation, blah, blah, blah. They're just bullshitting, using inflation to raise prices. Here's what's going on with energy inflation. Make it a little bit bigger so they can see that. Can you make that even bigger? Go bigger, bigger, bigger so people can see the years on the bottom. Okay, so that shows what energy inflation happened this year. Look at that spike. The last time it's been this high was Jimmy Carter era. That's not a joke. Energy inflation. Mm -hmm. no, it's people, only 70%. Yeah. It's only 7%. Yeah, okay. No, no, it's not 7%. Uh -uh. It's not 7%. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I got it. I missed the satire. I, 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 I buy groceries. <laughs> fake news. I'm fake news. Guys, guys, yeah, this is, is this what it's like? Is this so what it's like? Up. <laughs> Let me catch up to you guys. I'm a little bit behind. I'll catch up. Give me a couple minutes. Automobile inflation. Look at that. Highest in how many years? Look, even Carter was 28%. Dude, that's 35%. Dude. What are you talking about, but 7%? Who, who's saying that it's a myth, though? Yeah. Nobody in their right no, mind would believe are. that inflation Jen is a myth Saki, right now. Jen Psaki mm -hmm. said that these companies are using inflation to raise prices, and that's greedy. They're being greedy. Right. She, I went to Starbucks the other day. Mm -hmm. I tell Jen, babe, place an order for me for whatever this thing that you order for me. I don't even know what it's called. She knows what it's called. So uh, uh, a fog, something fog, I don't know what it's called. Anyways, it's sick. So I get this tea, and she says, babe, I called everywhere. All the Starbucks that I go order when I come back from the gym with E, she says, uh, they don't have the product. I said, what are you talking about? So I go over there. So I look at the girl at the cashier. I said, hey, can I get this one? We don't have that. Can I get this one? We don't have that. W what do you have? So she says, honestly, I, don't. I said, just put something in. Let me go talk to the girl at the front. I go to the front. The guy's a diehard podcast fan. Diehard. Like the entire time. He won't let me go because he's following the podcast. He says, uh, Pat, 
we don't have 80% of our products to sell. I said, what are you talking? He said, we don't have syrup. We don't have this. I can't sell you this thing. I said, just make me whatever. He says, let me see what I can do. Guy goes to the back to make me something that's not on the, what do you call it, on the menu. And he comes back. Oh, yeah, they're raising prices. There's shortage of product. Uh, if only there was Basic like a, stuff. 100 years of, of evidence of central planning failing. Yeah. Like if only. Anyways, I mean, the, the point is the point is that this article by CNBC, the average person reads this article, what do they say? You know, here's, here's how it goes. Okay, you know the guy that flirts with the 18-year-old girl who doesn't have game? And mm-hmm. the guy's 29 years old, experienced, and he sees this 18-year-old girl that's dating a guy that they're together, or like 20-year-old girl, and he says, let me ask you a question. Does your boyfriend, all he care about is working out, doesn't he? he yeah. He, he spends more time at the gym than you. Yeah. Let me guess. He's that good-looking guy that only washes his car and plays video games and hangs out at his boys, and he doesn't give you the attention you deserve. Yeah. If you were my girl... <laughs> From morning till night, you'd be my focus. <laughs> I'd give all my attention to you, yeah. and I think you need to be treated that way. You G- I'm a little, I'm a little uncomfortable focus. being in between. This yeah. thing. <laughs> I would give all my attention to. The point is, you write something like this, someone's gonna say my job doesn't promote diversity, doesn't promote equity, doesn't yeah. promote. It is a, it is well, not. It's resentment. Yeah. It's all resentment. So, uh, you know. It, when when people say that their workplace is toxic and they're listing these reasons, I'm thinking to myself, you know, what they're saying is, oh, my boss makes more than me. This is a toxic environment. Like, you know, uh, there's not enough. There's not equity here. Equity is like is like having the same outcome. You know, if if you're if you're expecting in the workplace that someone who works harder than you is should have the same outcome as you, otherwise it's toxic. Then you don't understand the workplace. You don't understand a meritocracy, right? I mean, and it's all, it all comes down to envy and resentment. It comes down to wanting what other people have, what other people are willing to work for that you're not willing to work for. Uh, and otherwise, and if, and if you don't have it, then you feel abused. I mean, it's like this childish, immature, uh, resentful attitude uh, that pre- people are bringing into the workplace. When I, when I heard toxic, I was thinking something very different. I was thinking it would be something where there's like, it's like this bros world where the guys are like, you know, the patriarchy's in charge and there's like sexual harassment and like, all this like stuff. Like Uber had. Yeah, I wasn't thinking point. diversity yeah. quotas. You're thinking like the Wolf equity. of Wall Street, what was going exactly, on? Exactly, Wolf of yeah. Wall Street, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. But I wasn't thinking diversity and, and equity and, and, and all of that. Hard, hard to tell who the two business owners on the panel are. Yeah. <laughs> but the uh, look, I've been in toxic workplace environments. And I think what Pat said before is really, really interesting because it's the amount of options that you have. And you made a, a correlation between this and relationships. It's the same thing. Like before Tinder, before Bumble, you had incentive to work things out with your girl. And then maybe you get through that. You get through your early hurdles in the relationship and it turns into a long-term thing. But now it's just like, screw this. Swipe right, swipe right, swipe right. Find somebody new. It's the same thing. You know, I I, I told you about uh, the encounter I had with the overzealous sales manager, you know, where, where I almost caught a felony. That's a toxic workplace environment. Now, at the time, Uber didn't exist. Lyft didn't exist. You know, now they do. You know, and, I, and, and during the pandemic, I went from two national tours getting canceled to having to do construction and lift. And you know what? It wasn't bad, man. You can make like you can make 40, 50 grand a year if you do lift full time. You're just sitting in your own car, you're listening to music, you're you have nobody to answer to. Now you have the liability. In a way, you're an entrepreneur in that way. You're taking it upon yourself. So I I am all for employees bettering themselves, bettering their, using their opportunities to leverage themselves into a life that they deserve. And I think at the end of the day, this will be a good thing for businesses to adjust, but it's just like anything else. You got to compete for labor in the marketplace, right? Mm-hmm. You have to compete. So that guy in, in your, the guy who was paying the dude 40000 now the person at the end of that line who pays 100000 is probably a moron. But the guy who's paying 40000 needs to adjust his business model as well, right? If he wants that same, like we think about this, like you buy this at Costco, it's 50 cents. So we have a valuation and this bottle of water is only 50 cents, but you go to the airport and it's four dollars. Now the person that's been paying fifty cents for this their whole life is like, who's the moron that's paying four dollars? You see three people go up and buy it. You're worth what somebody's gonna pay you. That's what you're worth, right? So I mean, are you actually worth that? Well, that's for people like you to ascertain. Like, what is what is my stress level on talent, right? What is my stress level on on em- employment? And then the other side of it becomes you push too hard, like the unions have done forever, and it's like, okay, well now you're forcing us to find another way. 
to do your job because you're too expensive and in come the machines or the outgo outsourcing, things like that. So, I mean, I just think we're in a very disruptive time right now where mm. I don't, there's people that, again, you know, I don't want to go on one of these long rants, but it's like nobody, you talk to kids under 25 years old, not a single one of them thinks about the the buying a house and the white picket fence and like they just think that they're going to live paycheck to paycheck their whole life so I'll if I'm not enjoying what I'm doing I'll bail and I'll find something else yeah and and and, and by the way that's the concern and FYI so in business listen Kmart started off in 1962 and a half it's called a super saving center with Walmart and Target they all got started the same year that was the super saving center, which is everybody came out with this concept of massive facility, cheap card memberships, all this stuff, right? Kmart and Walmart started competing. Kmart got money. Five years later, Kmart has 250 stores nationwide. Kmart is kicking everyone's ass. Guess how many stores Walmart has five years later? From 1962 and a half, guess how many they have? Five years later, Kmart's got 250. What do you think Walmart's got? Where they have at the, t at the same time as yeah, No, they started off zero, zero. On 1962 yeah. and a half, five years later, Kmart raises money. They got 250 Kmart stores. How many think Walmart's got? A dozen. A dozen? He's close. Nine. Mm -hmm. Nine. Nine stores five years later. Today, Kmart's out of business. Walmart has got two and a half million employees. What's the point here? You don't take care of your people, dude. You ain't, you ain't going to make it in capitalism. This, this business sucks. This concept of capitalism, you ain't going to sleep at night. If you're going to sit there spending your money going to gambling, drinking, bullshitting, not treating your guys good, someone's going to come and do it better than you. It's that simple, right? Walmart proved it. Kmart, Circuit City, Blockbuster. You can go on and on and on with the stories. Mm -hmm. There is nothing that's the great equalizer than business when you don't take care of your people. So businesses have that pressure forever. But let me put the, uh, the opposite side. There's more people that are employees than there's businesses. You also are creating a reputation. You know how, I'm going to put an idea out there. If, if somebody really did this, I think this would blow up. I'm going to put this idea out there. You ready? Okay. We have Glassdoor, no? Mm -hmm. So if you want to go rate, like you can go to Glassdoor and check my ratings as a CEO. It's going to say, oh, this guy's this, this guy's that. You'll hear some stuff about me, right? You can go check any CEO on Glassdoor. Fantastic. Okay. You can go on all these other places. How about we flip it? We create a Glassdoor for employees. Every... Every time you work at a company, you get graded. And the employer scores you when you leave the company on who you were. Now there's a glass store for the employee. So millions of people in America now have a score for how good of an employee like, you are. Sounds like, like a social, like a social, social credit, credit score. score. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. But, if the, but wait a minute. If the big guys have the pressure and they got that magnifying glass under, why shouldn't everybody else? I agree I, with you. So yeah, I, but isn't I, that what a resume is? They check no, up on No, it's not. No, it's not. Are you kidding me? Like, you know, when people I do interviews and I'll say, so, hey, there's a year and a half gap here. What happened? My mom was sick. I, I was, I, I, you know, I was taking care of my mom. During, you know, it was just a very emotional, tough time for us. I'm like, wow, man, I'm so. Hard. What, what are you asking that moment? Do you sit there and you can say, "Can I see a proof <laughs> of your mom?" <laughs> show me a can I yeah, show you a medical picture. record? <laughs> and a mom is 48 years old, dude. Your mom's a fitness model. You're saying, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the point is, this is the stuff that you don't see. So if mm -hmm. we really want to go there, I'm totally cool with it, man. Let's just put your score online. Let's yeah. see how good of an employee you are. And then maybe we realize, dude, this guy's been fired nine times in five years. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, we ain't hiring you or change because the market's overpaying you and you suck flat when out. Your former employee starts suing you. Yeah, yeah. And the former employees start suing you. Yeah, because you're giving them bad ratings. I, I think, I think if there is, I think if this was an open thing that we all did, and there's accountability on both sides, let's go at it. It's very simple. Let's I, go at it. I, so, dude, I, I think that there's a lot of people that would be super into that. Man. I like, think yeah. so too, and I think maybe it's a business model we ought to consider. Who knows? Maybe we'll do it. Anybody <laughs> else doesn't go do it. I'm do they say one thing about the, the uh, dating app? Do that where you, you could like rate your exes or something like that, oh. and it was like. Could, yeah, I'm sure there's not a lot yes. of vindictive it's, exes yes. or anything right? like that. that. Yes. I forget what it was called. But oh you could, my like, no, it was only women. Dating. Only women could date men. I mean, could rate like dudes. Uh, and okay. then like, but the problem with it was, was like, you didn't make your own, uh, oh man, what the, what was the name of this? You didn't make your own profile. Somebody made a profile for right. you. And then like, if you were a player, they sent it around. And the next thing you know, it was like, it was called like Pickle or something like that. What the Pickle. hell is it? What was the name of this That's thing, a man? bad dating guy. Yeah, dude. <laughs> hey, are you on Pickle? <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah, man. It, it was having, uh, they having it? exes rate you. I'm Oof. sure that's not going to be. Uh, you're not going to make it with an ex. Well, that's the, well, that's the same thing with ex-bosses. All things end yeah. poorly, or else they wouldn't end. By, by, by the like, way, I'll give know? you an idea. If you hired me at 16 years old, this was my resume. You ready? There you, you go. You shouldn't have hired me. X-rated lets you review your ex from hygiene to mojo to all the world to see. Huh? <laughs> 
Okay. It's called X rated, is what it's called. I don't know where I got pickled. 2011. That's old. Yeah. Well, Samson. Ten years X rated is a lot better name Samson. than uh, pickle. But yeah. <laughs> let, let's let's stay on this story. Uh, yeah. He was talking about some things. Can you go to the same PowerPoint by JD? I want to give this guy a proper shout out. His name is Jason Duran. He's the chief investment officer of NLG. Uh, the guy's an absolute G. He one time him and I had dinner together in Dallas. Uh, brilliant guy, chief economist there. So go to go five down, go five down, five down. Keep going, going until it's the three. One more down, one more down. Okay, they right here. Check this out. Go go a little bit so people can see what the title is at the top. So okay, what else is driving labor shortage? You know this entire time we're with this guy. He doesn't talk about inflation. He spends most of the time on this slide right here. Okay. Wage, inflation, wage, inflation, wage, inflation. Two slides up. Go quick. Two slides up. Wage inflation. Will declining labor force participation lead to wage inflation? This is a complete different angle on what's going on with salary. So go to two slides down. Watch this here. It says, number one, rising asset prices have allowed many U.S. citizens to retire early. Mm -hmm. So he says, number one reason why this is taking place is because boomers are leaving the workforce. Their million and a half is now 3-2. Yeah, so they can retire now. Because we're paying them rent. Exactly. So now they're going to say, look, I'm out here. But remember, baby boomers, there are 76 million of them. So if these guys retire, it's, not a, lot, it's a lot of people that are retiring mm -hmm. that can still do the job. Mm -hmm. The second thing he talked about is the younger generation is coming into the workforce later. So U.S. citizens are entering the war for, workforce later than ever. More than 60% of Americans have completed at least one year of college, up from 40% in 1991. So they're going in. Typically, let's just say we're going to workforce at 22. Now they're going in 26, mm -hmm. four mm -hmm. years later. So Makes you're not getting these. Sense. That's yep. a lot of sense. And then the last one he talks about is immigration into the United States at multi-year lows. Since 2016, net migration into the United States has fallen 76%. Can you zoom in on that? Because I want people to see those numbers. That's not a small number. Zoom in a little bit more and take it to the left. Yeah, a little bit more. Okay, that's perfect. So that's if you, the, uh, that's the legal. Uh, imp, uh, that's the legal. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah. That's I, the legal. I also yeah, like right. how it's they couch the it as yeah. net migration. So does that mean that there's a lot of people making money that are leaving the United States? Well, that's that could be the case as well. But look at that. So look at from 2010, 698,000 per year to 774,000 goes up, goes up, goes up. Then 2016, <laughs> Trump gets elected, million forty-seven. Then it drops to 930, 702, 477, 247. Mm -hmm. That's a low. So that means we're also not getting some of these engineers that are coming from India or some of these people that are coming from different places that are helping. So mm -hmm. the, the bigger concern he emphasized was wage inflation, mm -hmm. not inflation. You as an employer, you feel that. Mm -hmm. When you're going out there trying to recruit people, you're like, man, I want to get this guy here, but shit, the rate for this is this. And if I bring this guy from New York, your media company, He's making 110 over there. How do I sell him to come over here? It becomes unsustainable because yeah. you end up, you know, you got, when, they, when they're saying, oh, you know, I got all these offers other places, you know, and then they're trying to leverage those offers to stay where they are, but for higher pay, it's, you have to make a determination. Is it worth it to you to pay them that amount? And if you don't have any other options, in some cases you have to bite the bullet and do it, and the business suffers as a result of it. So, David, if you can get off that and just come back to us uh, so we can talk about this. It does. Uh, yeah. It definitely does. So this uh, is what forces many business owners that sit there and say, maybe i got to outsource. Maybe i got to get more technology. Maybe i got to figure out a way to automate this. Maybe i got to some of the stuff you got to figure out a way to automate because this is going to impact. You know what this is going to impact the most? It's going to impact the guy that's running a business making – you know, grossing three million and they're netting two hundred thousand dollars. That, that he's going to take a hit because yeah. he can't afford to do that, right? It's going to impact the guy that runs a, you know, a restaurant with fifty employees, and all of a sudden he's going to sit there and say, "Dude, I, I, how am I going to?" Because how many boomers have you seen as waiters? I go to Casa D'Angelo. I swear to God, there's like seven uh, bar, uh, seven uh, what do you call it, waiters that are fifty five plus. Mm -hmm. That's a boomer. They're 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 nearly sixty years old and they're waiting. That's a pretty good six figure income salary. So mm -hmm. if these guys are like, ah, I want to get out of it, dude, how do I replace this? Well, that's the same mm -hmm. thing. Think about that. Like, I mean, you know, if, if you're offering me 50 grand and I can make 50 grand as a bartender on the beach, 50, which one am I doing? I, I can see you as a bartender. <laughs> 100%, Fully. bro. Like, dude, you would the, crush it. I think the floor has come up. I mean, if you know just a little bit of Spotify and you know just how to create just a lit, like a, 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 a small internet business for yourself something on instagram with some targeted ads i mean you can make thirty five thousand dollars from home just just doing automated ads something you know what i mean so i mean there's 
there again, it's a disruptive thing. The business owners have to compete for the labor. The same way labor has to compete for the job, the business owners have to compete for the labor. And I, I, I do I feel bad for the business owner as a failed business owner myself? Yeah, and you put everything into it. But also the fact the guy has to, you know, eat fifty grand and go from a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar net to a two hundred thousand dollar net. Boo hoo! I want my extra ten thousand. Like you know what I'm saying? That's that's the game. That's the game that's being played right now. You guys want the labor. The, the 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 labor wants the capital, and the person who's this really is, killing it is the people who who own the other. Yeah, but stuff. Is, the, is the solution to just keep paying people more, or to find a way to get more people into the workplace and stay in the workplace? I think the solution is well. This, well, we didn't even talk about like who has access to credit and who doesn't. I mean, you know, that, that's another thing. Who has access to lines of credit? Who can play the long yeah, game? Yeah, but then but then that goes against your argument. How? Let me explain why. Let sure. me explain how and why. So, for example. Um, Okay, who does who who watch who reads this and says hell yeah? Who reads this and says hell yeah? Who reads this and says I freaking Walmart? Okay, who else though? International conglomerates. Who else? The employees were getting paid more. No, no, the main. <laughs> you're right. It's the employees getting paid more. But who sits there and says I freaking love this? I hope this goes another ten years. Guess who? You're on the right track, Gerard. Go for it. Tell Banks, me. the big companies. But yeah, the big companies are sitting there saying hell yeah. Mm-hmm. Force. My competition to go out of business. Sure. Yeah. Now, here's a part. Though. Anyone who can afford it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So Eat here's a part. Here's a part. Who do big businesses hate the most when they wake up in the morning? Competition. Small business. The government. Business, regulation. regulation. I don't they're, know. They I, love regulation. I don't know if they, they hate those guys. Believe it or not, I think what's happened the last two years, you, you really think Bezos wakes up and says, oh, that was a terrible, you know, $3 trillion. We said we should have never done that. Oh, okay. You made an initial $80 billion or two hundred. Yeah, your that that benefited him. Yeah. So, who this who got, who got shut down during the pandemic? Who didn't? Yeah. Do you think the big piss? businesses are some, are scared of the little guys on down the block? The oh, mom one and pop million shops? percent. Tell me why the big businesses are scared of the little what mom you, and pop shops. What are you shops? talking about? I mean, the little guys are Patrick Beverly. The little guys are these these players that are just annoying you. It's the small mm-hmm. business owner that's annoying you. It's the message he can give that you can no longer give because they the, can nip away at the margins. Yeah, the little guy is this guy. The little guy is us. The little guy is the guys like, listen, come work for us. We want to change the world. We want to do something big. The big guy's like, well, no, 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 you know, we're going to give you better benefits. Yeah. Like, oh, shit. Little guy's like, let's go against those guys. Those guys are the enemy. Let's go be, let's go do it the right way. People are turned on by the little guy. The little guy is very, very annoying to the big guys. Mm-hmm. So for you, as you're saying that, I agree. Mm-hmm. I think... I think, you know, the whole, uh, what did you call it? The tree filtering fire. What, what, there's a word you use. I said every once in a while, the forest needs to go through its uh, self. Uh, there's a word for it. You know, where forests catch yeah, yeah, on yeah. fire and then you have to, you mm-hmm. know, kind of get more sun. Yeah. Every once in a while, you kind of got to go through that. Mm-hmm. Where some people get filtered out and don't make it. And some people got to get filtered out both on the uh, employee end and as well as the sure. employer. I totally get that. But if your philosophy continues... The guys that are the biggest pain in the ass to biggest business owners are your allies, the sure. small business owners. Those are the guys that can't afford this. I, I don't I, I don't disagree with you on a theoretical level, but on a baseline level, I don't think the person who's trying to feed their family has to worry about, you know, in ten years out, what does this what does this mean for the global economy? I think that if they have the ag- the opportunity to twenty five at you know f- percent their income, they have to take it in that moment, right? So, and it's and again when I when I talked about access to to you know financing access to if you have receivables, you have access to to money that normal people don't, and if your business goes under, you can BK without personal responsibility in a way that people can't personally BK, right? So there's there's different protections available for businesses as well that aren't available for sole proprietors or employees, right? So, I mean, there's there's a level of risk in all of this for yeah, everybody. Yeah, the, the, the difference is in a business when it goes, um, you, you, you lose everything that goes with that business, the reputation, the investors, the idea of coming back and doing it again. You know, we hear a lot of success stories, but what mm-hmm. you don't hear about is a lot of guys that people didn't want to invest in because their first deal, second deal, th- third deal didn't go on. Like, listen, I'm done. You know, you can't figure this thing out. There's that story as well. I agree with you on what you're saying on the on the personal side, but you know, on the personal side, there's a lot less risk and it's a safer environment to be the, what an employee. There's oh a- my gosh, it's a lot. It's a lot more. You 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 listen. 
I've been an employee and I was a bad employee. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, Bob's big boy did the right thing firing me. Okay, you got fired from Bob's big boy. I got fired. So I'm, I'm very proud of it. Bob's <laughs> big boy fired me because I ate the coleslaw in the walk-in freezer, and if, too many times they told me that stop, was you. That coleslaw was delicious. Oh. I can say Bob's big boy in Glendale, Burbank. If you remember those days, I, Thanks, I loved bro. your coleslaw. It was okay. frozen? It was frozen. Burger King. I was a terrible chef. They wouldn't make me a cashier. Good thing they fired me. They don't work out. Hagen does. Hagen does. I probably gave away more free ice cream and I worked. I was, a, I was just like a guy that was having fun with everybody working there. Yeah, that guy should have gotten fired. I go to the military. I get my ass kicked. I come back. I become a great employee. I become a great leader. Things change. Life changes, et cetera, et cetera. I totally get that part. But on the individual side, like, listen. Today, you're like, dude, you don't want to take care of me? I got another job. Go. Mm -hmm. I got another place to go. Go. The employer can't lead you. Most employers are afraid to lead. Now, the employer that's done a good job and saved money, like, you want to go? Go. I'm mm -hmm. going to find the right guy. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. The small business owner who's only sitting on $200,000 in a bank, he can't afford to lose you. And today, employees are bullying small business owners mm -hmm. than the other way around. Not big business owners. You can't bully the big business owner. They don't give a shit. Go. Mm -hmm. But the small business owner today, Gerard, is getting sure. bored. How much of that, too, though, is the lifestyle changes? Like, again, the younger generation, they're living in vans, minimalist lifestyle. When Again, when I was growing up, if you were 21 living at home, you were a loser. If you were 25 and you had roommates, you were a loser. Like, now everybody lives at home until they're 30 or they've got six roommates in Brooklyn. Like... Everybody has this minimalist lifestyle. This entire younger generation, the Zennials or the Millennials, it's all about limiting their liabilities so that they can have freedom. They're exchanging the the wealth dream for a freedom dream. They want to be able to travel whenever they want. They want to be able to do whenever awesome. they want. Awesome. So, so again, so I don't have a problem with that. Don't. That's as, great. As employers, I just all I'm saying is that in this environment, yeah. I just think whoever adapts to this new generation of employees yeah. is going to win. I, I, I you, so their 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 motivations are different. Is what I'm saying. They're not getting married at 22 like our parents did. They're not raising I'm kids sorry, at 25. Bro, that, that's just a bunch of gibberish. And let me tell you why. It's not. Yes, it's it is. Absolutely it's, not. It's a bunch of gibberish. I've, I've lived. Let me, it. No, it's a bunch of gibberish. Listen, what are you talking about? Like the Woodstock era. Hippie era. What, what were they doing? Were they like, oh, maximalist? No, they were minimalist. It's a very what, small percentage of the population. Then it's a very minimal percentage. You know how inspired people are today to go create? And everybody today wants to be an entrepreneur. How many people's sure. Twitter profile in 1930 said, I want to be an entrepreneur? Well, no, but again, that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't that speak to my point that there's no, more options it, out there for No, them? it means today people are inspired to make an impact. They want to do something. But they saw what happened in 08. That's the whole story where mm -hmm. it goes through. This happened after 08. Mm -hmm. They saw their parents lose their house over the mortgage crisis sure. that happened and said, listen, I don't necessarily think buying a house is the American dream. And I think that's the part of it. Let me let me show one tweet. I want to get uh, Seth's feedback here. Mm -hmm. Go to, go to uh, our friend Robert Reich, the motivational speaker, um, who said, do you know how much CEO pay has skyrocketed since 1987? 100%. 500%, try 1,322%. This is unsustainable. Huh. I responded, it's a source of inspiration for kids to be a CEO one day. MBA's 1978 MVP Bill Walton made $100,000. Now Steph Curry makes $46 million a year. That's an increase of 46,000%. Is that unfair that people playing a game make more money than CEOs creating a job? I'm happy for both. You sound bitter towards CEOs. Yeah. FYI, you know how much the highest paid professor makes in America today? Do you know the number? The highest like, paid? Including book sales? or No, no, no. Just highest paid professor. What do you think he makes today? Uh, he or she makes today? 100 grand, man. No, 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 no way more than that. Way more than that. I'm actually curious what you say. <laughs> no, they don't make a ton of money, man. Give me the highest paid professor how much they make today. I actually researched this yesterday. The high, I, I got to assume it's somebody that's teaching law at uh, yeah, University yeah. of Harvard like, or something like Alan that. Is Alan Dershowitz making a million no, dollars a year? Just, 400 Alan, grand. Okay, that's a lot of money for a professor. Yeah. For the highest paid. Fauci, highest. Fauci makes 400 grand yeah. plus. Yeah. <laughs> the, professor so, Fauci. Doctor. So highest paid professor in America today. I want to I want to pull this up. Highest paid professor. I don't know if I send you the link. Robin D'Angelo, $50,000 a year. No, 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 no. You're about to be shell-shocked. The highest paid professor in America today. Pull it up. It's the first one right there. Go up there. David Silvers, folks. He makes, ready, $4.33 million Whoa. a year. What? Professor. Clinical professor Columbia. at dermatology and pathology, $4.3 million. Zev, 
Rosen Wax makes three point three million dollars. Professor, these poor professors are broke. Yeah, but are they getting paid? Are they getting paid by the school that amount, or they're, they're making that in their career and then they happen to be a professor on the side? They're making that as a professor. Two point six million. Them that? Keep these are, going down. These are private universities, at least. That's, okay, you know. William, one point nine million, one point one nine million. Harvard. Anyways, so so the point is, the point is, should we not pay these professors? I don't care if they're making that kind of money. Totally fine with that. Yeah. yeah. They never go after NBA players for the amount of money they're making. Hell, what's his name? Mahomes just got a half a billion dollar contract and he bought the Royals as a 22-year-old player. Yeah. So, you know, this whole thing with Robert Wright going after business owners, what, what are your thoughts on this with his position on CEOs having their salaries increased by 1,300%? Well, I mean, I, I think you nailed it. Bitterness, right? It, the, he sounds bitter towards them, resentful, um, you know, the the first of all, I'd be interested in knowing when he's talking about the pay increasing. You know, a lot of this, a lot of this is CEOs oftentimes have equity, right? And their value, their net worth goes up, yeah, um, a mm-hmm. lot more than their pay. This was one of the topics we were getting into with Elon Musk a little bit. He right. was like, you know, people are ma- people are acting like I don't, I don't pay enough in taxes because I'm this, you know, I have hundreds of billions of dollars yep. and I'm not paying enough yep. in taxes. He's like, my value is in my Tesla stock. You know, investors decided that Tesla is a trillion dollar company and I own 20% of that company, which means I'm worth $200 billion. And that doesn't mean I haven't realized those gains. So I'm not going to pay taxes on that, on that money. And the second but he starts of selling wealth, it off, it goes down. So it's not even real. <clears throat> and it, yeah, and it may go down. The value of Tesla may, may go way down next year. And then his net worth goes way down. Um, but those things come and go. But he took the risk of building that company, almost went bankrupt at, at, at certain points. Um, but yeah, I mean, CEOs take a lot of risk. Um, you know, if, if they're providing value that results in that kind of pay, then that's good for them. And people should be inspired to try to get to those roles, those positions, rather than saying, you know what, you make more than me. That's wrong. We should make the same amount. Um, that kind of like, that's but when people start thinking. Who actually thinks the employee should make as much as the CEO? Anybody like, I, like we work with hundreds and hundreds of people. I've never heard anybody here in this building or in any other company I work for that say, what is the word you know what, I should you make should, as much as Pat. You should hang out with some more socialists. I, I, Do you remember that company? It may be in like the corners of Brooklyn, but I don't know anybody on the, in, the, in, the, in the real world that actually thinks that the underwriter should make as much as the CEO. Was Who the was the guy? It's never happened. What was the last time you were in Los yeah. Angeles? Who was the guy that that, uh, that was a CEO and he was making like a couple million or five million Dan a year? Price. And he I had him on. Dan Price. Dan Price. Yeah. I had him on. I had him on as a guest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He decided he gave everybody, everybody 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70K, yeah. right? Yeah. Including himself, right? Yeah. They all got paid the yeah. same. Like, that, does that make him? How did that work out for him? How did that work out for him? You know what I asked him when I interviewed him? What? I said, let me ask a question. You think everybody should be paid the same? I do. I said, who owns your company? He says, I do. I said, wow, you want 100%? I own 100% of the company. Wow, your company does a lot. So you're worth about $100 million. I am. Mm. I said, how many employees you got? He said, 100. I said, I think you should follow your philosophy and give everybody 1% of equity. Right, share if it. If you really share it. are about, and you should have seen, the, I, if you've never seen this interview, you got to watch that reaction. He was so upset with me when I <laughs> asked that question. I said, it's equity. Yeah. You, you, if you really want to follow that philosophy, yeah. follow it all the way through. Right. He says, I'm going to think about it. Right. <laughs> I'm like, okay, salary, uh, dude, yeah. e- equity matters so much more than I salary. Agree. Equity is the fastest way to wealth creation. In a business that's growing, you, don't, you hold equity in that business. That's how you create wealth, not by trying to incrementally increase your salary over and over and over again. So you know, CEOs that get there, that figure that out, you know, they deserve that money. Yeah, and with millions of sleepless nights, miss, missing a lot of parties. By the way, that stat... Uh, the whole uh, 1,322, I'm going to look it up because yesterday Ruslan sent me a text saying, I don't know if you saw that, he sent a message saying, is this calculated based on this? I said, just go read this link. Mm-hmm. Here's how they came up with that, uh, with that formula. The formula that everybody keeps talking about, CEOs were paid 350 times more than employees, all this other stuff. Go all the way down. What, what do you think was the average CEO of a top 350 firms in America in 1978? Uh, uh, Gerard, what do you think is the average salary... In to, of the top in, in 350 today's, firms. In today's equivalency or? No, no, in that time. Um, in the, Not inflation, just pure. What was their salary? 1978. Of the 1978, what was their salary? <sighs> well, I mean, you know, if, well, who? Top 350 CEO firms. 78, Reggie Jackson was the first million dollar player, right? Is that true? So I, I, let's say 500,000. Okay, cool. Go down. By the way, this is the average less of top. Less than that. Less than that, right? You're yeah. right. It's less than that. Now watch this. <laughs> I looked at this, I'm like, there's no way, keep going down, keep going, you'll see it, it's a very, it's a uh, chart right there. The average salary of a realized a CEO, realized uh, uh, compensation was $1.7 million in 1978. What? Exactly. 
okay? And today it's $24 million. So they're upset, but they forget that in 1978 they were making 1.7 million. Tyler, what's so one, more what's, than that? Tyler, what's 1.7 million in 1978 dollars today? What's the equivalency? What's 1.7 million in 1978? The, the, these conversations to me, man, are like they're just so like distasteful. But too. but it's here's like, the part, though, yeah. Gerard. If Who it's cares not what somebody else is making, if it's not right. unpacked, it sounds like what up. Are you kidding me? Of course. Right. These guys shouldn't be paid this well, the, kind of well, this money. Is, this is what they do. This is the manipulation. Let, let's find out here. Go. 1.78 million. You, is that million or billion? I think we you put billion. billion. Put yeah. one zero, which is fine. Yeah. 7.6. 7. Okay. Yeah. So it's what? Three times more. Yeah. Three times more than the average inflation rate of 3.36. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So and they've created more value, bigger company, sure. more employees. They get paid more. But that's so, the idea. You build, you win. I mean, winners, winners are supposed to win. I mean, that's the idea, man. Like so, then the formula is really they should say it's increased three times more, mm -hmm. adjusted to inflation. So but they'll never say they this. They lie with money. <laughs> so just like the just like our great emperor Joe oh Biden said, the media needs to do more to stop disinformation. Well, and this is but this is what creates the resentment that leads people to thinking they're working in a toxic workplace, totally. right? Like this is they don't have to say they don't have to say everybody should be paid the same. Yeah. They just have to say they shouldn't be paid anywhere That's near right. as much as they're being paid, right. and then they can get everybody else to resent and, them. And they, That's right. And then they feel it, the pressure to have to re just how their company's structured to try to make everybody happy. But Seth, they somehow make it like that money should have been your money. Like that money created was somehow supposed to be somebody else's money. Right. They, everybody looks at it like like it's a big slice of pizza. And if this guy has two slices, that's one less slice for you. It's not. It's air in the balloon. If anybody wants to do a fun little thing, draw a little square in a balloon and blow air in it. And as the whole balloon gets bigger, watch that square get bigger too. That square is yours. So when the economy grows, your square grows with it. It's not somebody else's slice that's What a great visual. What a so, great I mean, visual. Sauce Talks money visual, by the way. Right Sauce Talks we'll money. Take care of that. Okay, so Let me say one thing about employees. You're the last though. person and we're changing okay, Let me just say Go one ahead. thing about please. So, because I, obviously we've covered a lot of what CEOs yeah. think. We have two, I assume you're CEO of your company, a yeah, founder or CEO. A, 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 a phrase that gets used or doesn't get used enough, I think, uh, is the great reset. Everyone's talking, the great resignation. Everyone's re uh, resigning, resigning. Yeah. No, these people are falling else. I mean, unless they're just sitting home collecting unemployment, which I don't know how many people are still continuing to do that if they are, mm -hmm. you know, loserville. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people really are just, it's the great reset. Basically what COVID did is a lot of people had to sit home for whether it was three, six, nine, 12 months and say, does this really what I want to be doing with my life? Is this, am I working in hospitality? Do I actually want to do this or do I want to pursue something else? So a lot of people have taken this time to say, let me reassess really, and you've touched on this, is this, is this giving me meaning and purpose in my life? And a lot of people have just changed Careers. I think 50% of workers are thinking about changing an actual career. So I know we're talking about a lot of CEO and CEO pay and a great resignation, sure. but these people need to fall somewhere else. There's always going to be losers out there that have no purpose or drive or willpower that want to do something with their life. And they're just going to take the government checks and yeah. the stimulus and take the unemployment and just leech off the government as much as they can. But a lot of people are saying, you know what? I was working in hospitality. You know, there's a difference. You talk about this all the time. There's a difference between having a job and having a career. So all this great reshuffle, if yeah. you know, if, 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 if maybe that's a different term, is people saying, you know what? I'm not finding fulfillment and finding joy there, in so, this. So Let what, me find something I can do long term. What that should be your goal. I, so what percentage is that? Because the flip side of that is the following, which you have to be very careful with. So this one guy posted something the other day. Freaking ridiculous. Ridiculous thing he posted the other day. Uh, Cindy Kobo sent it to me. I wish I want to give this guy a shout out. It was such a freaking emotional thing to read. Uh, Cindy, uh, you send it to me. Let me see. Hang on one second, guys. I promise you this story is worth you reading. I'm going to send this to you. Uh, uh, it's by Sean Whalen. I don't know if you follow Sean Whalen or not. Yeah, lions, not sheep. Uh, is that what it is? I don't. I actually don't follow him. That I, guy I, actually owes me ten thousand dollars because we bet that <laughs> because we bet the guy with the beard and the tattoos. Yeah, yeah. yeah we bet okay, much like how we had up. a bet who would win the presidential yeah, the, election of 2020. But you got the money yeah, here. Yeah, so, I did. You paid me. Sean yeah. Whalen's ducking pull, pull me. Pull up. Pull up what I just sent you. And put it up. So this guy posts a story, and I think it has a lot to do with what you're saying. And people have to be very careful because a lot of people can listen to what you just said and said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. But the reality is you just could when shit got tough. Let me show this to you on what he put as a father with his son. So incredible, incredible story. Uh, uh, so can you make that bigger? So that's him and his son, okay? 
that picture itself is so emotional when you just look at that kid. Look at that kid right there. Mm -hmm. All right, so I love being a dad more than I'll ever be able to orate. This is my son after a bloody war of a wrestling match tonight. Real talk. He's been hating wrestling this year. He's 15 and in his head about a lot of stuff, trying to figure out a lot of things, and he flat out didn't want to wrestle. I told him he didn't have to wrestle, but he had to get a full-time job instead by a certain date, and he didn't. So as a man of his word, he wrestled. It's been a mental battle for him. I've been watching him and working to be a supportive but encour encouraging dad to hold space for him but to push him. This morning, he got pinned, and I could feel his frustration. I could see in, in his energy. He was mad and dejected. So after his match, we had a chat. I told him, as I've told him many times, that it's in the deep water a man is forged. In, it's in the pain that the strength is found, and it's only the hottest fires that makes the strongest weapons. I told him earlier today that inside of him was a savage, a literal raging lunatic, lunatic, and that's who needed to show up in the next match. I told him to imagine that this match determined if his family literally lived or died. I had him close his eyes and visualize winning to visualize his savage inside of him. Right before he got on the mat tonight, I grabbed his face and told him, I love you, now go be violent. <laughs> he went three rounds, bloodied his opponent, and came off the mat with the victory and blood pouring out of his mouth. I was emotional. I was choked up because I saw the savage. I saw the man who overcame the frustration and fear and the man who will walk into life and not succumb, succumb to mediocrity and pain. Life is, un is not fair. Life isn't easy. Life wants to kill you and beat you down at every turn. And tonight I saw my son dig into the place in your soul that most humans run from and avoid. I saw in his eyes the savage gladiator who will find peace in the storm and who won't run from fear or pain. I love my children. I love them deeply. When they are woven in my heart, they are woven in my heart, and I ask God every day to give me strength and insight to lead them. Tonight was a special experience. I will never forget. I pray he never forgets this. This is emotional. So to me, Adam, as much as I want to sit there and agree with you, I hate to say this to you. A lot of people call me when they're going through that moat, and you know what they're simply doing? Things are hard, and they're quitting. Mm -hmm. Things are. If you quit because things are hard, and it's really you're in the heat of the moment, you ain't making a career change. You're going to go to another job or company, and shit's going to get hard there as well, and then you're going to quit again. It's like relationship. Marriage is hard. Relationship is the hardest thing you'll ever do. What are you going to do? Go find somebody else, and it's going to get hard again and hard again and hard again. For 10 or 20% of people that make sense that are going through mm -hmm. that, I totally get it. For the other 80% that are selective hearing, they're looking for, I saw a sign on a billboard that told me change careers. Yeah, we can look for many reasons to get you know a lot of different things that leave behind. People have to be very careful on messaging. Again, I may be wrong, but I'm telling you, I saw something like this. I would much rather teach my kid to say, by the way, good for him as a dad to say, you, you're either going to get a job or you're going to quit wrestling. You know, you're going to do one of those or keep doing wrestling. Anyways, maybe wrong. It is what it is. I admire a man like this. I just wanted to give him props. Thank you for inspiring me to share the story or else I would have forgotten Well, let it. me just say, my, yeah. I've been at the same job for 15 years. Yeah. You know it's in the financial industry. You know what happened it in 2008. Easy, bro, you though. think I had a, a, you think it was good as give an that message. But give that message, okay. bro. No, no, what I'm saying to you is, Inject that philosophy in That's people. That's fine. Dude, you're a millionaire because you didn't quit last 15 years. I agree. Yeah, you're a freaking stud. How many freaking times could you have been distracted and done something I else? I agree. However, if I hated my job two years in let and me, I didn't want to stay get, there, I would have found something else that I would have crushed. Let me get this straight. Tell me you wake up every morning saying, I can't wait to do another life settlement Not deal. even a little bit. Okay, then. <laughs> right, exactly. But, but how come you haven't quit? Because now the money's too good at <laughs> no, this point. But, but, but how, many, how, many, first, how many years into it did you start making money? Uh, a couple years in. It okay, took me a couple years in. And then there was a dip after the recession, and, and then I had to build my way back up. And you were in an industry exactly. that had a lot of you know, and a challenges. Lot of people, let me just sing to, yeah. to your praises here. Everyone in... Um, Everyone was basically trying to get into the mortgage industry in 2006, 2007, yeah. 2008. And then everyone in the mortgage industry tried to get into the financial services industry. And to look at the tables of turn, everyone is getting out of the financial services industry, trying to get into the mortgage industry. It's just everyone wants to follow a hot topic, hot trend. I get it. But this goes back to my initial point. Think, yes, things will get tough. You got to stick it out. It's not always fun. It's not always sexy. But you need to find a career. And ultimately, what I'm saying is if you're not happy in your job... And you just need to take that reset or, you know, resignation, whatever, but find your career, more power to you, bro. But yes, like this guy, like just the wrestler, don't do it because it's, it's not tough going to be easy. And Every, and whatever, I think nights. everybody knows yeah. whatever career path you take, it's going to be fucking tough. How, how long have you been doing the writing business? Uh, I've been at the helm of the bee since 2018. Okay, but, but it's saying, when did you start your, your writing career? Uh, well, I've been an entrepreneur since 2012. 
Okay, so yeah. at so, any point, did you feel like quitting or just, nah, this is not for me? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard work. <laughs> you know, I don't, I, don't get, I don't get to take days off. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it, 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 it bleeds into my vacation time, my family time. You know, it's very difficult. It's very, it's, it's strenuous. And there's also obviously, you know, all the risk that comes along with mm-hmm. it. You know, not, not every business succeeds. I've had my share of failures, investments that failed or startups that failed. Um, so yeah, it's hard. You got to, you got to pick yourself back up and, and continue to just push forward and, 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 and believe in yourself that you can get there if you continue to, 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 to go instead of quitting, mm-hmm. right? Um, the minute you resign yourself to just thinking, I'm going to take the easy road. Well, you may, you may, it may be easier, sure, but it's certainly not going to be as lucrative or as fulfilling in the end. Um, because you didn't go out there and accomplish as much. I mean, all these things that, you know, the, 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 the challenges, the, the, are what in the, in the perseverance through it is what builds character. It's the same thing. Like you never have an opportunity to have any courage unless you're in danger, right? Like the, these kinds of things the, the positives come in response to the negatives. Um, and, and that, and that's how you, that's how you sharpen a blade is with that friction, right? Look at his um, eyes, so. by the way, look, look at his eyes, honestly, look yeah. at his eyes. You know, for me, eyes tell a story. You know what those eyes tell you? You said you have an eight and a six year old. I, th- I yeah, I, yeah. Okay. Dude, that, those eyes are like. You think I want to be by the business or my kids, dog? Like, yeah. what do you want me to tell? It's the pain of a person. Right? That that part needs to be given more. I want to change subject because mm. I, we haven't had any of our subject. Mm-hmm. This twenty minute story <laughs> became an hour and ten minute story, and we were, yeah. we had a meeting yesterday to get more structured, and we broke our own rule. But well, we this was our get, top story. This was fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, next one, uh, Joker. Lose a shot at tennis history as Australia deport star. I'm going to read two of the stories uh, about this guy. And can you pull up some of the tweets uh, uh, in regards to uh, Joker? So uh, Novak uh, Djokovic, anti-vaccination stance, uh, has cost him a potential payday of $2.1 million and a shot at tennis history after the play lost his battle to remain in Australia and was deported. The Ser- uh, Serbian uh, boarded a flight from Melbourne. Uh, airport late Sunday night after the nation's federal court upheld the decision to revoke his entry permit over fears his presence would strengthen anti-vaccination sentiment. It wasn't up to the court to decide on the merits of the decision, only whether it was uh, illogical or legally unreasonable. Unreasonable. The player could face a three-year ban from entering Australia, but the prohibition may be waived if there's uh, uh, under compelling circumstances. Okay. So this whole situation of him, what people don't realize is, I think this would have caught, this would have made him the greatest of all time by winning. Can you see who has the most majors in tennis? I think they're, they're tied. all tied. They're all tied at 22, right? Federer, Djokovic, and, and Nadal. Nadal. Yeah, and and if he wins, he would have been number one. He would. He almost won one, one like two, three months ago. Like he won second place because the other guy beat him. Right. But by the way, that would be on US top Open. of his winning record against them individually. He has a winning record against Federer individually. Mm-hmm. He has a winning record against Nadal Sick. individually. So if he also has the most majors, goat. then the argument starts to go in his favor that he's mm-hmm. the goat. Yeah. And you're a tennis player, so you I'm would know this player. stuff. You follow yeah. this stuff. Yeah. There you go. So 2020. 20 uh, total, six Wimbledon, eight uh, uh, for Federal. Okay, so that's that part. Now, go to what some people have to say about this, and I want to get our uh, panel here to see what their thoughts are. So uh, uh, who's this? Law Girl? Who is this person? Do we know who this person is, or is it just a user? Just user. Okay. Djokovic cannot visit Aust- Australia for three years. We are, o- we are the only country that thinks it's okay to lock out the number one tennis player on the brink of being the best in the world. Not because he's a health risk, but because he might make the 90% of its citizens already vaxxed not get a booster. So go to the next tweet. Let's read a few of these guys. Um, uh, make it bigger. Okay, no, uh, Joker is great tennis player. Is a great tennis Mia Farrow is a great tennis player, but he lied. And worse, he knowingly exposed people to COVID, had it with him, and every other arrogant, entitled person. They're all dangerous in one way or another. There you go. Next one is Pierce Morgan breaking COVID rule cheat, immigration from liar, and anti-vaxxer icon Novak Djokovic loses final appeal against deportation and will be thrown out of Australia without being able to compete in Aussie Open. Look at that picture. Yeah, Melbourne right above him. Uh, and go to the next one there. Uh, uh, ben, uh, who's this from? Ben uh, uh, Dominish. I feel like Australia underestimates uh, how this Novak uh, Djokovic incident's grown to tar the entire nation as fundamentally anti-freedom and a place you should not visit for a long time to come. As a tennis player yourself, what do you think about this story? Uh, I look. I, I think at this point, uh, Djokovic is a champion not just of tennis but of freedom. I mean, he's he is he is pushing for uh, personal individual freedom to be able to make your own decisions. Um, the the man is healthy. The man is currently healthy, and he's not—he's prohibited from playing, from staying in the country, and from playing the tournament. Why? 
What is the reason for that? I, there's rules. Everybody has to follow the rules. But are the rules stupid or are they reasonable? Um, you know, if somebody's healthy and if he gets the vax, he can still spread COVID um, and people can still get it, then why is he prohibited from playing just because he doesn't have it? It's his individual choice. The man's currently healthy. If he passes a COVID test and he's COVID free when he walks into the stadium, why can't he play? That's my question. But, um, you know, he was willing to put, I mean, look, if he wins this tournament, which he was actually fairly likely to win it, um, he's the best player in the world right now. And he's won the Australian Open how many times? Nine times, maybe? I think it's like, it's his, right. like he's won it his, more than any other. Like how Nadal has the French Open, he's got the Australian. It's the one he's yeah. most yeah. likely to win. He'd win three and a half million dollars. Um, you know, the fact that he's taken this stance could potentially cost him his sponsorships. Lacoste is looking into whether or not they're going to continue to have a here. relationship Get with him. Get out of here. He makes $30 million a year on, on sponsorships. So that's, I mean, that's his primary income, right, is his sponsor. So he put a lot at risk here to be able to stand by a conviction. I respect that. Um, and, I, and I'm disappointed in other players who are piling on to him saying, you know, he's selfish. Any major player? Than oh, one Andy man. Murray? Uh, Nadal's had comments. Nadal's um, been Nadal's the most been hard outspoken. On him. Yeah, what did Nadal say? He, he basically said the tournament's bigger than any one person. You know, the focus needs to not be on him. But he also said he knew the rules before he showed up. He knew the rules. He should have followed the rules. You know, we all had to follow the rules. He's he's not a, he's not special. He's not an exception. And I think 98 he of said the top all of that? 100 yeah, yeah. players are vaxxed in the... Men's yeah. tennis association. Yeah. What am, well, they're making life easier for themselves, and and you know it it, it you, ha, you have a choice to make. You you have mm-hmm. to pay. You, there's a sacrifice now, and that's what they're trying yeah. to do. They're trying to make it extremely costly to not go along with the program. And the question is, does the program even make sense? Adam, what are your thoughts on this story? Well, look, I think, and I've actually asked multiple friends of mine who play tennis and have you know actually played against Federer. You know these types of like legitimate people. And there's a couple different angles I'll go here. On the actual Australia, like, he did lie and, you know, mishandle this. And it was, you know, I forgot to do this. And he did show up to a freaking photo shoot while having COVID. So he could have handled it better. I'll give you a different perspective. If you asked everyone in the world, uh, everyone around here, who are the best tennis players? Most people would say Federer, okay? Most people would even say Nadal. I don't know if, I think... Nadal and Federer specifically have such a grasp on who is the best tennis player because they're more likable and have a bigger persona and just their personality is more. Djokovic, I feel like he doesn't have as much of, and you're a tennis player, Mm. as much, you know, likability within the tennis world. Like we actually had, like he's tied as the, the greatest ever, tied. But nobody, I don't think, really understood that. So I feel like there's a part of him that even with COVID, wants to get out there, win, become the great, become the goat, you know, become the goat. But I don't know if he has the the likability of. You ever seen Federer. his interviews? Have you ever seen him do interviews? Not that like I can tell you a lot about Federer's personality. Yeah. Nadal, you know, good looking, suave dude. I don't know much about Joker. Let me honestly. tell you, I've watched this guy's interviews, and to me, I I look forward to his interviews. I look forward to his interviews. Why like, is that? It's because. The, like you can feel the level of intensity and commitment to his craft and when he loses or makes a mistake like one time he hit the ball i don't know he hit the uh, person on the side i don't know what it was the situation he and how apologetic he was like, he yeah. felt like crap in the interview afterwards like he was like and it wasn't a big deal but he was like it could you and you could felt the, feel the uh, sincerity i don't know he got uh, booted out of that tournament. Yeah, I know way. he did. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I, I I know he did. And and he said I deserved it. Like he didn't even come out and like you know how oh, Dak Prescott yesterday is like, uh, yeah, I was a referee. They threw uh, you know whatever they threw stuff at the referee. This guy took responsibility for his actions. I think the fact that he, listen, if you got COVID, you're this big of a name, you can't go to a place and not tell people you got. COVID. Did he have COVID? I mean, if I mean, he did, he tested if, positive. If he did. Once, I don't aren't know aren't the these story. Tests unreliable. He had no symptoms. You know, he's got no if, symptoms if at all. He, he does have COVID. Now, having said that. He should have tested that, again to make sure. Yeah. If, by the way, here's the flip side of it. Here's the flip side of it. How many flights do you think you're on and people who are on flights have COVID? It could be the person sitting next to you. You don't think people get on flights that have COVID? Anyways, Gerard, Definitely. your thoughts. We'll go to the next subject after your thoughts here. Tell us. Bro, the most famous moment of Michael Jordan's career is when he had a highly contagious virus and he had 103 freaking fever. And he went out and won game six. The flu game. That's a great it's point. It's the flu game. Yep. This dude was highly contagious and was praised for going for fighting through it. 
How many people did the and evil you bring, Michael you, Jordan you bring up a really good point. to a, influenza? It's a, it's a different time. Though. It's a different time where the wrong people have the microphone. We've got to tell these people to shut up. Anybody that from from Australia that's allowing their government to do this, you you this is on you. I've never met anybody from Australia that was this type of person. Everybody from Australia I've met was a man's man. Loved freedom. Hardcore person. Same thing with Canada. Every Canadian I ever met was an awesome, awesome, hardworking, freedom-loving person. And you're letting these tyrants take over your country? Like this? That's what I'm saying. The rules are Come stupid. Come on, man. The rules are stupid. This, dude, we're not allowed to say mass formation psychosis. We're not allowed to say it, right? But maybe we could say collective Munchausen syndrome. Everybody's a threat to everybody now. Everybody's sick. Everybody's a yeah. threat to your well-being. This is complete and total bullshit, dude. This is one of the healthiest human beings on earth. Literally, quantifiably, one of the most healthy human beings on earth. And you won't let him into your country because he's a threat to your physical well-being? What type of crazy bullshit world do we live in, in now? Right. This is outrageous. Yeah, the only thing I would tell you is, the only thing I would tell you is, if you're in a time like this, at this level of sensitivity, in a country that's the most sensitive... You, you, you have to take slightly a different approach. You don't have to play the tournament. Don't show up. These are the rules they created, okay? You can't go and say, for example, like what you're saying to me, yeah. we're probably more on the same page on what you're saying. Yeah. But this is Australia. This is their rules. If that's mm -hmm. what they're doing, if you knew, I don't know the story if he knew or not. Mm -hmm. That's the part about the story. With him and Aaron Rodgers are kind of similar. By the way, a little bit of kudos to NFL for not doing anything to the guy. So that yeah. tells you, as much as Roger Godella and NFL gets a lot of heat, good for them for— He's going to win the MVP. Well, what I'm saying is, well, some of them are— I don't know if you've been following stories lately. They're saying Brady may win it. I think it's Rodgers as MVP, mm -hmm. but they may give it to Brady. But if you think about how Godell, this kind of validates, maybe the NFL is doing a little bit better job than we thought they're doing yeah. than tennis, especially for Australia. Anyways. Well, the next thing up is the French Open, and it's going to be the same thing again Oh, there. you, you, you didn't know, see you, the story you, that they said they may not let him play in the French Open? They may not. Right, yeah. exactly. Wimbledon's going to be the same. It's crazy it, to me. It, You're saying that's the next major. Yeah. yeah. The well, next well, there's going there's there's to be, French open, uh, there's gonna be things, because that's not till May. Right. So keep in mind, I think there's a there's an event in Dubai in the next few months. There's a Miami yeah, Open yeah. in March. It's yeah. the right. people, though. So we'll it's, see what happens with that. It's on the people. It's on the people of Australia. It's on the people of France. It's on the people to say enough's enough. This is nonsense. Just a just a quick comment too about your your his reputation. You know, mm -hmm. like I I mean I follow the sport pretty closely. I I, I know a lot of people who don't like him and who mm -hmm. have kind of gotten that same feeling like he's not a very likable guy um whether that plays into this or not and people are just out to get him i'm I don't cool know. with it i'm just saying not yeah. as likable as federer uh, yeah maybe not um you know federer for a long time got real cocky remember federer started walking out with a vest that had like his initials on it like and he was the greatest he's number one on his mm -hmm. shoes you know I like mean, he got he, well, he, he was, really was, was though, yeah, exactly. he was, yeah, was. He was yeah. but there was a lot of arrogance there and djokovic yeah. has never done that he's never called himself you know the greatest and worn number one on his shoes and all that i've seen him overturn calls that the umpire made in his opponent's favor because he saw it was clearly in mm -hmm. when the umpire called it well, out. Well, he was up 6-1 you know? yeah. in that match. Guys, this is bigger than Novak Djokovic. This is, they made an example out of him to show the rest of the country who's in charge and show right. the rest of the world they won't win long who's term. in charge. They won't win right. long This term. is the thing, Pat. Yeah. And this is, this is, I was just out in Miami and I did yeah. my, my whole thing on my story and it was like, here's the truth of the matter, man. Like, we all have to make a decision. Even if you're on that team, quote unquote, if I want to go to a restaurant in New York City, do I really have to show a permission slip from the Democratic Party that I'm that I'm I'm obedient enough to eat? Because let's just say let that that's what it is. Mm -hmm. That's what the Vax Pass is. It's a permission slip to the elites that I'm on board. Mm -hmm. I, I, I I may I may I may I please have a slice of pizza, please. I'm, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm okay with the Democrats. Like, how can you be okay with this? Mm -hmm. But but again again, here's what it goes back to. Jedediah Bila was sitting right here. When she said, let them sink. I don't have a lot of money, but the little money that I have, I'm going to pick it up and leave. People like that are making a decision. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, Gerard, <clears throat> you know, uh, when you pick up a bad habit, how long does it take until you realize this, is, this bad habit is ruining your life? Uh, Ten years or so. Mm -hmm. but, but, but watch what you just said. No, no, I'm, I'm actually being very serious with you. Think about it. We all have had a bad habit that yeah, got yeah, a hold yeah. of us. I had a bad habit that got a hold of us. How hold of me? How long does it take until you realize it's going to hurt you? Yeah. Well, how long do you do you realize that it's going to hurt you? But then after the longer it goes, the longer it takes to fix it, man. But but again, but how long until you realize 
there's a there's a consequence to this bad. Well, there's habit. a difference between realizing yeah. it and actually doing something about it. Though. Yeah, well, I realize asking, it in you a. You guys all just became scientists. Five, now. We're the five, five, hey, basic fat, five trust five the years. science. Five We've been saying years. it for all this time. Yeah. Why would you trust I got the science? enough in biology. That's why I struggle with it. But just one other thing here. What if the other players? What if Nadal instead of saying these are the rules you got to follow? What if Nadal has said, you know what? I'm not playing the Australian Open if they don't let Djokovic play. And then if and then if like dominoes, other guys got to back play. Why am I not happening? And you know who did that? Not happening. What a freaking then there's point. no tournament. Yes, yeah. No yeah. tournament. Great freaking point. Then they would have to say, you know yeah. what? Let the guy play. He's healthy. Yeah. I thought that you would happen in the that? NBA. But, but, but do you know who did that in the NBA? Who? Kevin Durant yes. to Kyrie Irving. Yes. Did he stand with him? He did. He yeah, says, yeah, yeah. I'm never going to ask him to do it. Yeah. I support my teammate, yeah. Kevin Durant. And guess what? The NBA finally said, all yeah, right, let but, him play on the road. Yeah, but the difference is he actually played, and he's been dominating. He's been MVP type caliber Who are you talking about? Durant. Now he's out for a month, though. Six but, weeks, yeah. But, but... To Seth's point, if Durant said, look, I, I'm going to stand with Kyrie, and if he can't play, I can't play. Now if literally the league's potential MVP is saying, I'm also not going to play, and half they the players power. stand with they them, they have weight. They yeah. have power. People, this, this goes but to the American people, But they love basketball too. too much. They're not going to try to get into the – if they're look, not getting paid. It, go, it applies everywhere. If we all stand up <laughs> yeah. to tyranny yeah. Yeah. together, yeah. then they can't push us around anymore. It it's true. when everybody's compliant and everybody's feeling that pressure because 99% of people are going along with it. You stand out. When, when Djokovic but, stands up and stands against it, he stands out. Me, he's man, the one that they can strike down. Question. Let me ask you a question. Because he's by himself. How many of you guys listening? Be honest. Apes guys, are strong. No, no, he, he, hear me out. This is the part that I love capitalism and competition. You have no idea how much I trust competition, okay? How many of you are thinking about in 2022, family vacation, straight up, you're going to Australia? Any, anybody right now? <laughs> Nobody. I'm, I'm so inspired. Nobody. You know, Zero. <laughs> you know it's, what? A, it's a great point. Yeah. I, yeah. Let's Nobody's go going. to if Sydney. The if the, shot, if the <laughs> sharks and the stingrays don't care for the government, if your competition <laughs> works. If competition you're vaxxed, works. If you're vaxxed, you might want to no, do that. No, you're not going to go to Australia even if you're waxed. No one's outside, bro. Like, what am I going to do in Australia? The other day, I got a, I got a text from a guy on a cruise ship. <laughs> He's on a cruise ship. There's 150 people on a cruise ship that fits 4,000. He's like, here's me having breakfast with four other people. Literally, he recorded the whole yeah. thing. Nobody. What are you going on a cruise ship for? To be alone or go to a freaking different place? There's, there's, there's a next, price to be paid There's your next this. Babylon yes, there B is. headline. Not yeah. enough, there's not enough tourists to leave five stars. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's go, let's go to the next story here. Uh, next story, uh, out of the 270 doctors in regards to Joe Rogan trying to censor him, only 100 were actually doctors. Which is quite interesting. So let me, what page is that on, by the way? Is that a page five, five deal? Right, let me go to page five. Uh, following the release of a viral uh, Joe Rogan Experience podcast episode featuring guest Dr. Robert Malone, a letter from uh, more than 270 doctors describing Rogan as a, by the way, this is a post-millennial story, describing Rogan as a menace to public health was sent to Spotify during uh, urging the company censor the podcast star. It's uh, since been revealed though that a large portion of those doctors are not practicing medical doctors. Over 50 were PhD academics, 60 were college professors, <laughs> 29 were nurses, 10 were students, four were medical residents, and a handful of science podcasters were included in the signatures. Uh, signatories of the letter, Dr. Malone's interview has reached many tens of millions of listeners vulnerable to predatory medical misinformation, mass information, mass misinformation events of this scale have extraordinary dangerous ramifications, the letter states. Uh, what, what difference does it make if all of them were doctors? What, what if all of them were doctors? Like, doctors can't disagree with each other? I mean, you know, you can get 270 doctors that say this, and you can find 270 that say something different, and, and that's debate, right? That's Heresy! Uh, there is like, but one science, yeah. and it is the word of <laughs> science. How dare you blaspheme science? Who, who get, which doctors get to speak for science? Who, who who decides which doctors get to speak for science? Anthony Fauci. He is the science. He is science, right? I am the science. Praise science. Praise be to the science. I agree with you. I don't think even if it was 270 doctors, 2,700 yeah. doctors, that Spotify would have changed their stance whatsoever. We talked about this last podcast. They've, they're winning right now. Yeah. And if they... Even if they were even a little bit, you know, concerned with these 270 doctors, the fact that it's just like really laughable. It's like, well, it's actually a nurse and actually a, an EMT and a couple of drunk guys who are actually a intern. Like, I don't want a guy yeah, who stayed at a Holiday Inn Express yeah, exactly, last night. Exactly. I think it's only going to strengthen their stance. I don't think Spotify is going to do anything. If there's anybody that's uncancelable at this point, yeah. we're looking at him right they here. It's winning. Mr. But, Joe Rogan. But look, this is the same thing that happened with Chappelle. You try to suppress speech like this, and you draw more attention to it. It's the Streisand effect. You know, 
Streisand wh- effect. And the I Barbara went, Streisand effect? I tweeted about this. Yes, the Barbara. You know what that is? The Barbara Streisand Let's effect? Let's hear about she it. She home by like mm-hmm. suing the photographer that took the pictures, and the lawsuit attracted attention to the pictures, yeah, and then of millions of people saw them. So right. she drew attention to these pictures that she didn't want anybody to see. That's the Streisand effect. It happens every time they try to censor people like this. I tweeted about this mm-hmm. when I saw that it happened. I'm like, now I have to watch this interview. Now I have to. Right. I want to see what they don't want me to see. But by the way, just, just food for thought here. One of the most important men in the world today, I want to keep emphasizing how important this man is and protect this man, folks. I'm telling you right now, is a guy named Daniel Eck. He is the CEO of a company called Spotify. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for him, Joe Rogan would be off of Spotify. Power to Daniel Eck, the CEO. Again, Mm -hmm. highly paid CEO, folks. We should be like, really? He he makes a lot of money. Evil. evil. Highly paid CEO has the backbone to say. I'm calling on him to apologize right now for how much money he makes. (laughs) He needs to apologize. How dare you, sir? He makes $17 billion more than the average Spotify artist. Oh, my gosh. Listen, Danny, you like your stud. Keep doing what you're doing. You're impacting the world in a positive way say, for giving a voice. What I don't like, though, Pat, is the what Robert Malone told you in that in that interview that doesn't exist. The, <laughs> the name that the, cannot got, be named. They, they, they went and, and the Biden administration said, don't say this. He says something. And instead of them counteracting it, there's a hit piece the next day in The Atlantic. And then social media, LinkedIn and Twitter, use that hit piece as an excuse to take him down as fake news. Right. So there's very, very clear causality, causation, the whole not whatever. But there's mm-hmm. there's a very clear chain of events here. And it's like, man, they've got a whole hit squad infrastructure on how to justify taking you down. There's there's a literal plan in place, a censorship plan in place that's coming from the people that we have in charge of protecting us. There's that also a market is response. Devastating you got uh, Rumble hosted his interview after YouTube took it down, right? Didn't they? T- they actually took that down, I think, right? Getter, I think that's Yeah, thing. Rumble is hosted. Rumble's like an alternative to YouTube that's like a free speech alternative and they're like they're the views on that are going crazy and people are flocking to rumble um, so there's a market response to this too where people are you know getting fed up with YouTube and everybody telling them what they can and can't see like let us decide for ourselves let us take in information yeah. from both sides and decide for ourselves like trust us to do that yeah, the, the I got pe- a call with the rumble CEO this week they reached out it's they, listen all I trust I'm telling you folks no matter how much go through idolizing competitors to demonizing competitors to humanizing competitors trust competition it's good for you i'm telling you competition is good for all of us let's go to the next story because we can go 15 more minutes desantis says there's something going on with desantis and trump right now that's a little bit uh, mm-hmm. i don't know if you guys are following the story closely or not desantis says he regrets not speaking out much louder against trump's recommendation to stay home okay DeSantis, uh, this is a CNN story. Uh, Florida Governor DeSantis said one of his biggest regrets in office was not speaking out much louder in March 2020 former, uh, when former President Trump advised the nation to stay home to slow the fast spreading coronavirus. DeSantis blamed people like Dr. Anthony Fauci for advising Trump to consider a shutdown. Fauci, the country's top infectious disease expert, was part of the coronavirus response team that led by Vice President Mike Pence and included other health public experts. Uh, public health uh, experts, but the decision was Trump's to make, and DeSantis ultimately followed the White House lead, closing Florida schools, government buildings, gyms, bars, and restaurants, dining rooms, and advising Floridians to stay home. Uh, the other day, Trump was being interviewed. Uh, who was he being interviewed by? Was it Hannity? I don't know. He was being interviewed. I don't know who he was being interviewed by. And he said, you know, there are certain governors out there that don't even have the backbone to say they've taken a booster. Didn't say name. Didn't say name, but we know the girl that always interviews Trump, what's her name, from Fox Business, uh, Bartiroma, is it? Uh, Maria Bartiroma. She was interviewing DeSantis, and she said, hey, Governor DeSantis, have you taken a booster? And he didn't necessarily say yes. Mm-hmm. Didn't say, yes, I've taken a booster. Trump, when he was asked by Hannity, he said yes. What do you think is going on here between Trump and DeSantis? I think, I think DeSantis is trying to put distance between himself and Trump. You know, show show that there's a difference between him and, and how he handles things. Because I mean, like, what Trump is still the front runner, right, for the nomination? Yes. I mean, that he's in the in, Republican you know, Party, seventy six percent. Yeah, he's still, yeah, he's still yeah, right. the front runner. Um, DeSantis, you know, has received a lot of praise from the right on his handling of things, uh, criticism from the left. You know, they called him Death Santis and all of that. Um, <laughs> but you know, the lockdowns were so heavily criticized on the right 
And a lot of people saw it early on. A lot of people said, hey, if we keep kids home, there's going to be problems. If we, if we, if we stay inside, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be drug problems. There's going to be depression. There's going to be suicides. There's going to be that, you know, like people were really telling a warning about what would happen. And a lot of people went along with that. I think it's good that he's saying that he regrets not coming against his strong. I don't know that, you know, necess- hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? Like, can you really know that that would have been the right thing to yeah. oppose at that time? Uh, maybe not, but I think he's trying to distance himself. From I got Trump. a question for you. Follow up on that on that topic. Sure. It, it, the only reason he would distance himself is because he may run in 20, 2023, 2024, Because if he really doesn't want to run for president in twenty twenty three, twenty twenty four, he wouldn't push too hard against Trump because he's going to need Trump's votes in twenty twenty eight. So if sure. he goes this angle, the way I perceive it is. I think there's a my chances of DeSantis wanting to run officially went up 20, 30 percent simply because of his comment he made here. That's, because that's how I see it. You yeah. have no other motive to call out Trump in this in this set setting here than wait if you really only run in 2028. I yep. think he's running. Yep. I don't know. You I think, think he's, he's running in 2024. No, I, listen, that, that what he just said right there, he's mm-hmm. trying to tell you. Voting for me is very different than voting for Trump. Yeah. That's a campaign message. Again, mm. I may be wrong. Yeah, I think that I message it. works in the general election. There, Listen, if Trump wants the Republican nominee, everyone should just stay home and not even waste their freaking time. Republicans are on board with Trump. If you're a anti-Trump, rhino, whatever, dude, move over. Trump has that nomination. Now, do I think Trump is going to get elected in the general election? Likely not, but we'll see. We'll see if if he's still as polarizing when it comes to 2024. I don't think Biden is going to run again in 2024. If if I'm DeSantis, I look at the nonsense and I say, I know you might disagree. You think he should, you know, strike while the iron's hot. I look at the nonsense and I say, dude, I'll just see you guys in 2028 and just be the man and just and 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 completely dominate at that point. I don't think he wants to be in Trump's shadow. I think that is not good for his long term legacy. Being Trump's VP, I don't think that's his look. Gerard. You die the hero, you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. He's hot right now. He's never going to be hotter. There's never going to be a weaker opponent if he's ever going to run. It's now. If he waits four years, that's four more years. But what do you mean by a weaker opponent? The Democratic Party is as weak as it's ever I'm not even talking about He has not even – like you got to get through – your primary before you even think about Democrats right now. And he's not – do you think – here's the question for you. Sure, sure, sure. You're a pretty smart guy. If DeSantis runs, Mm -hmm. and obviously Trump, I think, is going to run, is there Mm -hmm. any chance DeSantis, you know, unseats Trump as the um, as the nominee? You the Republican Party? I think you'd be shocked how many people, traditional conservatives, would back DeSantis over Trump. I I think that the so you think DeSantis would beat Trump in a a primary? Is that what you're saying? I'm I'm not saying that whatsoever. I'm saying I think it would be a better fight than you think it would be. And I, I, I personally believe MAGA has always been less about Donald Trump and more about somebody, anybody willing to fight back against the. The, 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 oh, I the disagree. Left. I think it's just Trump. That's it. No, I. All right, it's, so it's, answer it's the question: reaction. Can DeSantis beat Trump in a primary? Yeah, for sure. I, for sure. <laughs> yeah. There's no way you can have that kind of confidence for sure. <laughs> yeah. Can yeah. DeSantis beat Trump in a primary? Well, let me ask it's you a question: Why away. would you ask a question if you weren't going to accept an answer that came from the? Question? I just. I, let me ask you a question: Do you think white is black? No, it's not. You're an idiot. What kind of a question is that? I just, I, 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 I respect the fact that you actually think that way, but I just, you think actually somebody in, in today's climate, you think anybody can beat Trump in a Republican primary? Uh, I swear to God, I think sometimes, man, you wake up in the middle of the night and you think Donald Trump's standing over your bed or something like that. No, He's not, not the boogeyman. The guy has the nothing. The guy has 85%, 90% approval rating in the Republican Party, if not if it's higher than what, that. What's DeSantis? DeSantis isn't doing well in Florida. How, how, I don't think much, people know him on the national on, level. Let me ask you this. How much overlap do you think Donald Trump's audience is with Ron DeSantis's? How much overlap? Meaning similar beliefs, similar values, sim- similar how much principles, overlap? policies. Very similar. Very similar. How much overlap do you think there is in Ron DeSantis's audience to Donald Trump's? Who has broader appeal? Nationally? Sure. DeSantis. I, I said I would vote for DeSantis. I wouldn't vote for a Trump. So then like what, you said, what you, the 12%. So then you just answered yourself. Who can yeah, but I'm not in the Republican primary. Would you, I'm talking ever, about Republicans. would you ever have thought that it was John Kasich who made it to the end of the last Kasich, primary? Yeah. 
Dude, no, that's I mean, well, that's a traditional, you know, Mitt Romney-esque republic. Every, it was exactly sweetheart. governor of Ohio. Every establishment GOP, all the establishment GOP money, all the donors, they're all going to go. Seth, ready. what do you think? What do you think about whether he'll run? Yeah, no, whether he can beat Trump if he runs. Uh, I mean, these the polls change all the time. Uh, it's hard to predict those things. I, I, I as of if it was held today, I, th- I don't think he can beat Trump. Um, you know, we'll see what happens over the course of time. What else happens? What else? I think the media has done a very good job of painting DeSantis as reckless and uh, getting it. You know, when you go outside of Florida and, and people, when they hear about what's going on in Florida, you know, a lot of people think that Florida is like being like, like run into the ground yeah. by DeSantis no, and he's just killing people. No, you know, dude. the media is like is doing a good job of Seth that. Nation. Everybody's off. moving got, to Florida. I think you're way off, man. I got so many friends and family in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. They think Ron DeSantis is running the promised land down here. Yeah. Well, I mean, the numbers there, of people flooding the, here, there's I mean, part prove of what, that out, but there's a, to there's some a extent. Part of, dude, I'm in Nevada. I'm in California. I'm in different places. Here's what everybody says. Dude, how bad is Florida right now? I'm like, what do you mean? Mm. How bad is Florida? It all depends right on where they get yeah, their so, information. So just, just, just where just they get so their information. And by the way, the, the way you judge to me who is the real candidate is who the opposing side trashes more. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so check this out here. Check this out. This kind of validates his point. Okay. Go to page six. Go to page six. Uh, January six panel member floats Fourteenth Amendment as a way. To bar Trump from holding office. This is a Washington Examiner story. Neither of Donald Trump's impeachment trials led to his conviction, which would have prevented him from returning to the White House. Representative Jamie Raskin said, has another idea on how to bar the former president. Raskin suggested that the constitutional provision preventing those who engage in insurrection as a, or rebellion from holding office may prevent Trump from becoming a president for a second non-consecutive term. Having lost to President Joe Biden in 2020, Trump is eligible for another White House term. Polls show him the clear favor to win the 2024 Republican nomination if he runs. If there are people who did participate in insurrection or rebellion, they're constitutionally barred from holding federal or state office again. Raskin, a member of the White House Select Committee, formed the investigation in general. <laughs> There's also another part of, you know, for example, Donald Trump has already been determined to have participated in the insurrection or rebellion by the virtue of pitch. Okay, so you see where the story goes. Yeah, that's, so, ba- that's bad news for George Washington and John Adams, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, 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 the place where I'm going <laughs> with this is, where I'm going with this is, who is mainstream media trashing the most today? That's who you got to look at as the number one. Yeah. So, so, so I think they're still. Th- this is the one guy. I was watching Don Lemon and Chris Cuomo the night uh, Biden won when sure. it was announced that Biden won, and you see Don Lemon's like, yeah, "Look, I don't care with you. Yeah. Just you're with us because we won, and this is you know this is just very emotional That's right now." That's uncannily good, Don Lemon. Right now, there. did you yeah, see yeah. Don <laughs> how he trashed Biden last night? I did. I did. No, did yeah, you I see that? I don't hate myself enough to did watch that yeah, yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah I was I pretty bad. I mean, uh, well, Biden's had a horrible week with the voting rights and the and the mask mandates. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, it was just, uh, yeah. Come on, man. Worst week of uh, a presidency could possibly have. It's been a terrible week for that guy. To the point where Don comes after you mm-hmm. and mainstream media comes after you. So, Charlemagne this, the God. Yeah, this website called Babylon B, fake news you can trust, claims. Kamala Harris is so bad, Hillary Clinton may it's run. It's a dangerous website. Yeah, so I don't know if you know that side or not. So dangerous. Point is, who the hell is going to run on the other side? We still can't come up with a name on that side. <sighs> I don't know, man. Michelle Obama, we yeah, discussed that last podcast. That. We'll see. Anyways, okay, so that's the part with Trump's story. I Let think, me go to I another. Hillary Clinton's considering losing again. Is, is there, I mean, is there no shame with this January 6th stuff? I mean, is there just no shame whatsoever? They're just, they found their narrative, they're sticking to it. And, and this almost goes to what you were saying before, Pat. Like, you could fool people some of the time and not all the time. There's so many Democrats that I know. I mean, I grew up with nothing but Democrats. And as soon as they compared this to 9-11, everybody around us was like, uh, what? Come again? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. What's up now? That's what I'm saying to you. What? Loyalty, it's loyalty is, loyalty is, you know, you have to know that there is your parents. You ever seen your parents are like, okay, yeah, I don't know, mom. Yeah, that is, no, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that I don't, I don't know if we're going that far. No matter, so when a bad argument is presented, you're gonna sit there and you're gonna say, listen, I know I'm a Democrat. Yeah. I'm a registered Democrat. Yeah. My entire life I voted Democrat. I disagree with you. It's a say 9-11. This is a completely different story. They've lost their mind when they go to a different angle. Anyways, let's go to one story here. Cowboys, they lost. <laughs> Again. Uh, can you pull up that stat uh, that we have on the amount of victories 
uh, 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 <clears throat> the amount of victories the, the Cowboys have. Did you see that the so last bad. 25 years? <laughs> so here's no. a question for you. Before you pull it up, I want to see what he's going to say. I'll send you the, uh, what do you call it? I'll send you the tweet to put up there. How many victories do you think the Cowboys have had Playoff victory since since twenty five years, the last twenty five years. When does, Barry does that go far enough back to yeah, Troy Barry Aikman Switzer. and Emmitt Smith and yes, uh, after, yes, after it does. They, after they twenty five uh, years, won their Super Bowl. Twenty five years. years. How many playoff wins do you think the Cowboys have had in the last twenty five years? Tyler, I'm going to text it. Matter of fact, just go to my Twitter profile. How many playoff victories do you think they've had in, in twenty five years, years? Is asking in the last twenty five years. How many is it? A handful. Go the other way. So you said a handful, right? Yeah. Go the other way. Five? Go the other way. Is it five? You said five? Yeah. Okay, go a little lower, a little lower, a little lower, a little lower. If it's not that way, maybe it's the opposite way. I don't know. Yeah, go the other way. Up, go up, go up, go up, go up, go up. Check this out. You're about to be blown away. Boom, click on that. Click on that. The Cowboys have had three victories in playoffs 25 years. <laughs> Colin wow. Kaepernick's got four. Guys, Brad Johnson, Mark Sanchez. Mark Sanchez ran into his lineman has got four. Trent Dill for five. Jake, if you asked 100 NFL fans who Jake DeLome is, they couldn't tell you who played for. <laughs> oh, the, the Panthers, man. Carolina Panthers. He went yeah. to the Super Bowl. Five. I understand. Mm-hmm. But five. More than the Cowboys the last 25 years. So now here's the question. What, what, Stephen A. Smith's having a time of his life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, these guys, He's all year it. long, people thought this yeah. was going to be the year. Dak no. got the money. Okay. A lot of people thought this is their year that they could do something. Dak got his money. Dak got some really good games. I think... He broke Cowboys' record with 37 touchdowns. In 17 Romo's games, record. one extra yeah, game. Yeah, 17, I'm sure. That's, that's yep. a good point. But, but I think he missed a game. I don't know if he missed a game or something yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's really 16 games. Very so, true. Yeah, so you got to give him the credit that he did that. What the hell is going on with these guys last 25 years? <laughs> what is it? Any, any speculation? Well, at least, at least Romo can now say, well, it wasn't me. You know, <laughs> you know it wasn't I'm me. Gonna, I'm going to give you <laughs> an I'm answer. I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and you're going to have a hard time defeating this. Okay. Because... In the past 40 years, yeah. you've said there's been, uh, you know, three, two Republican, uh, two Democratic presidents, three Republicans. We've had uh, Reagan. We've had Bush. We've had Clinton. Back and forth. Back, back and, and forth. forth yeah. back, who's been the one constant? Um, I agree. And it's been Fauci, has it not? Yeah, yeah, I agree. In the past 25 years, who's been the one constant? It wasn't Jimmy Johnson. Yeah. It wasn't Barry Switzer. Coming for the CEO. It wasn't, Jay- yeah. it wasn't Jason Garrett. Jerry Jones, your 85-year-old old ass, you're out of touch, buddy. Time to take a move. It's time to stop running the team. Turn it over to somebody else. Wow. He is the one constant. If the Cowboys, plus he makes too much money. Uh, Make way, way too the much. If the Cowboys money. actually want to, <laughs> we need to tax uh, him. That's really yeah, that's true. If the Cowboys actually want to, you know, get over the hurdle, Jerry Jones got to go. I, I, you know, do you have any other? Uh, Dude, I just think it's like it's just one of those like it, the, the legacy media. It's like the cow. You know, I saw one tweet that was uh, from Barstool that was hilarious. This is a rough year for the Cowboy Yankee Laker fan. <laughs> this is a, a tough year yeah. for him, dude. It's a uh, you know, there's there's so many franchises that are just famous for being famous. Mm-hmm. Like Notre Dame is on every Saturday. They they haven't won anything. You know the Cowboys, America's team. They haven't won in a generation, man. It's like uh, these are the these are the. They game. did dominate in the nineties. But you got to realize, yes, they were the and shit. Ga- yeah, and Game of Thrones was amazing for six seasons. <laughs> you know, but so, the way okay, it ends so let me, is so let me, so let me ask you this. So let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Okay, so I had this conversation with uh, what is a uh, pen? Pen Tom Pen? Is it Tom, Tom Pen? Pen? Yeah, the NBA. Tom Pen, uh, the NBA. Uh, what are you describing? What he was the cap specialist, the salary cap guy. I had him on. Yes. I said, uh, and he was a president of LAFC, the soccer team. He was a president of that. He's team. a numbers guy. He's a numbers guy. So I said, who's the most important building? Is, is that the David Beckham one? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. I said. So who is the? I think so. I may be wrong. No, that's I think the so. Galaxy. That's the new yeah. one. The clear? LAFC is so, the new one. No. So David clear? Beckham's here in Miami. Yeah. Now, David baby. Beckham oh, played for LA Galaxy. David, the voice of you, God listen, over here. You upset at David. David. He's awake. But, but, but you bring up me soccer. Out. David's gonna step hear up. Hear me out. You got a few different things here. Okay. To build a championship team, you got the owner. Mm-hmm. You got a GM. Mm-hmm. You got a coach. Mm-hmm. You got a superstar. Mm-hmm. Which one are they missing? None. That's the whole point. Who the Cowboys? They keep, they, no, no, I they keep thinking it's the coach. The Cowboys. I disagree. You got okay. So so for example, if the Cowboys get mm-hmm. Bill Belichick to go there, mm-hmm. would things change? No. Well, Bill Belichick can turn a franchise around, but to your cre- to your answer, okay. you it said owner. Change. Okay, so there you go. Yeah. But, but wait a minute. But wait a minute. So so if Patrick Mahomes is traded for Prescott, 
are things going to change? Dallas had the number one offense in the league and most turnovers in the league. They were a good team this year, and they just shit the bed, per usual, <laughs> right? It's, it's Jerry Jones. You know what it is? Maybe they just need to sage a at t Stadium. Have they thought about saging the stadium? They just got bad juju. Yeah, Who's the know. GM of the Cowboys? Himself. Ca- exactly. Himself. I thought exactly. it was his son. Yeah. I thought Stephen Jones was no, the guy. It says, it says owner yeah. and general manager yes. of operations is himself. He needs to step aside. I agree. Let's get some See, young that's juices in there. That's kind of where I'm going. Bring the and GM also, in. And also, the same, the, Fauci needs to step aside. Trump needs to step aside. Biden should run again. Let's get all these old-ass baby boomers out the door. Have a great life. We still love you. Let's get some millennials and Gen Xs. Is that in, a campaign in, speech because you're running <laughs> yes. 2023, 2024? Vote for Bet Adam. David's Let's go the- Adam is what's going to happen. <laughs> By the way, this Thursday, great shirt, this Thursday, this Thursday, Rashad Evans will be here on the podcast. Sure, Rashad! Sure. We're going to have a lot of different conversation about the UFC. <laughs> Cannot wait for that, folks. Put it in your calendar. Same time. Thursday, Rashad Evans will be entering the vault. Having said that, Seth, Seth appreciate you for coming on. This was a Vlad, man. Appreciate you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye.